Radio, where gamers roll. Gaming Nation and welcome to The Forge, your Genesis RPG podcast covering everything that you need to know about the latest and greatest from Fantasy Flight Games, all new Genesis Foundry, and of course, the Genesis role-playing game. I'm your host, GM Hooley, and we've broken our promise of once a month episodes to bring you our next episode much sooner, because there is far too much happening in the world of Genesis Foundry. But I'm not going to talk at you for the entire episode, instead I'm going to talk at this guy... GM Chris, how's it going? Fantastic, man. I'm excited, I'm pumped, I'm jazzed, I'm I'm ripped. I'm what other what other what other slightly onomatopoeic metaphors can I use? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I tell you what, it's been insane with the the amount of stuff that's been going on. There's been controversy, there's been uh, like excitement for new settings. Not it's really. just been amazing. There's been excitement. There's been controversy from like three people. Yeah, I know, but still. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's been absolutely but, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It, it's been it's been an interesting couple of weeks. Um, uh, you know, following the announcement of the foundry. Yep. Um, and uh, it's oh god, it's just it's so exciting, and there's so much new great stuff out there, and I just I god ah, okay. I, I want to get into it because we, sir, have a show to do. Should should we just get into talking about what's happening out there in Genesis land? I think that's a very, very good idea. Let's start it off with some exciting announcements and news in a segment we like to call Stoking the Fire. Stoking the Fire. And welcome to Stoking the Fire, a segment dedicated to letting you know all there is to know about the releases from the Genesis Foundry and the Genesis Roleplay game. But first, Chris, would you like to tell us about our D20 Radio podcast of the week? Absolutely. This episode, we're going to highlight some more Genesis love with another Genesis podcast. Don't despair! Uh, helmed by well-known community faces Scott, Rob, Bill, Anastasia, Matt, and Zach, they released their first episode last month. Um, it's a great episode that is appropriately all about doing a good session zero <laughs> uh, for your campaigns. Uh, so go check it out. Great show. And you guys can find this and more amazing gaming and geekery podcasts over at d 20 Radio. Dot com. That's for sure. It's uh, an amazing podcast. Scott um, has wrangled that together quite well. He does an amazing job. And he's, the stuff that he does in the community is just uh, insane as well, uh, being one of the, the lead moderators for, the, uh, for Reddit, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the big Genesis Facebook group. He does some amazing yeah. work. Got a lot of time for, for Scott. He's a good guy. Yeah, he is, and 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 Scott and uh, and Guillaume, uh, Bill um, are are like in design wizards, <laughs> um, this... and both with some excellent products up on the foundry. Yeah, well. absolutely, so. absolutely. We'll hopefully at some point maybe get them on the show to talk about their stuff. That's for sure. Oh, I think maybe. <laughs> maybe. All right, so, uh, and now on, on to some Fantasy Flight and Foundry news to begin with. Um, another post Gen Con nugget from FFG, uh, which we didn't dive into into our first episode. Now, FFG also announced the, the next Genesis product after the Expanded Player's Guide and the GM, um, the GM screen, uh, which is Keyforge. Um, the, oh, it's so cool. Um, and talk about cross promotion. <laughs> it's, yeah, no kidding. Uh, so FFG is basically their bonkers successful unique deck game. Which if you if you haven't ever tried it before, it, it's I've played it a few times with Huzz, and it's really really good. Um, and I'm not really into card games, but the fact that you can just go out and buy just a, a starter and you're right to go. Um, is fantastic. So, uh, so yeah, it's like it gives you it gives you the the enjoyment of playing a collectible card game in terms mm. of variation. Yep. But 
it, but they've intentionally designed it to where it is not a case of he who has the most money wins. No, that's right. So it's, I, I mean, I mean, somebody who's just getting started has, at least from a mechanical standpoint, has an equal chance of kicking the crap out of a seasoned player. Yeah, and I, that's that's very hard to pull off. Indeed. So, fun, fun stuff. And the one thing that I absolutely loved at Gen Con, as a side note, completely. Um, is that they had uh, a vending machine which was just handing out um, decks of uh, of Keyforge uh, packs, which I <laughs> thought was nuts. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so the setting basically is a bit of a kitchen sink, sci-fi, fantasy, all sorts of things. Um, it's due to come out on uh, in the second quarter of, of 2020, and a lot of fans are quite excited. I know it's, we certainly are here as well. Um, so basically, um, you know, the people are wondering what a setting like that would even look like. I don't know. It's insanity is what the setting is because it's <laughs> such a kitchen sink. Yeah. Um, so it leaves one wondering, um, I can't wait to, to learn more about it and dive into it. Um, uh, I'm sure more articles will be coming out in the months to come. Mm. Um, and, and, and speaking of diving into things, Huli, with a little less than two weeks since the Genesis Foundry has been live mm-hmm. on Drive Through RPG, mm-hmm. uh, the first glut of content that was not a part of the launch has already started to come in mm. uh, with some exciting things. Uh, I mean, what do we got to talk about? So we've basically got the expanded archetypes, um, the story spanner, which um, SF Ratten brings us a quick and fun download of three new archetypes. Uh, for Genesis, the Disciple, the Gymnast, and the Rascal. Uh, besides having some amazing cover art, uh, and it is it, it's spectacular, uh, this five-page product gives us three new archetypes and a set of alternate archetype uh, abilities for the four archetypes in the core rulebook. It's free, which is amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so quite the bargain. It won't break the budget at all. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, I'm interested to get. I was really fascinated by the alternate archetype abilities he had in there Ooh. for the for the four archetypes that are in the core rulebook. Yep. Um, um, a couple of them, I'm like, ooh, uh, I really want to get them on the table. I, I uh, well, like one in particular, I'm like, is that balanced? I, mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, but I'm sure he play tested. Hopefully, so Ooh. so uh, quite there. Um, but one thing I know is balanced and well play tested um, because I, I I've been a part of that journey as well as right. many of us have. Yep. Um, is uh, a new product that uh, came out in lickety split order from um, D20 Radio's own Chris Hunt, mm-hmm. uh, who made us all squee at the Foundry launch with his power of the Vril weird war adventure he quickly followed up with a mini supplement Mm -hmm. called armor of the vril Mm. it offers npcs vehicles weird war upgrades and suggestions for tank themed encounters so cool Um, it's it's slim sexy and full of punch and it's only a buck (laughs) amazing yes very very cool and the one thing that I was lucky enough to get a bit of a look at as well and have fallen in love with it um, is uh, from the ever-prolific John Dunn, uh, who uh, who brought us the... Uh, I can never get this right. So what's it called? Anthro, the anthro- anthrochimerics. Anthrochimerics, uh, which yes. is basically an archive uh, supplement uh, to the, uh, the foundry um, that came out at launch. So this one uh, is called Hope Prep School Freshman Handbook, um, which is kind of like a super school, I guess. Yes. Uh, yes. Which uh, is written by uh, himself and co-writer Jennifer Harding. Um, it's uh, it's Genesis compatible player guide uh, for the Mailor Vyas popular line of Hope Prep Adventures, uh, all about prep school for metahumans. Um, so the cool, the coolest part of the title, it includes John and Jennifer's take on a system for metahuman abilities, uh, as I was saying before, superpowers uh, adapted from the magic system presented in the core rulebook, which is something that very much interests me, uh, having done a little <laughs> bit of uh, stuff around the Marvel sort of stuff, uh, and I've kind of have been asked to uh, to do something like that. For the uh, for the foundry, but with all the serial numbers um, scrubbed off, but we'll see if there's time for that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and that title's uh, available now, and it's only for four ninety nine. Definitely a bargain yep. there. 
Yeah, and the art, the layout's fantastic. It's yeah, great. Absolutely. Um, and you all, you all listening can learn more about what's on offer at the Genesis Foundry uh, via the Fantasy Flight Games website at fantasyflightgames.com or just head to drivethroughrpg.com. Mm, indeed. All right. Well, before we get into the main topic of tonight's show, let's enter a segment we call Die Casting. Die Casting. So the Forge podcast is all about bringing new creations to the table, and the Genesis RPG provides us all with a powerful set of tools to do so, existing skills and talents. The die casting segment is about closely examining individual skills and talents and how they relate to the creations you craft. Now, last episode, we discussed the skills of melee and range, but tonight we're going to shift our segment to take a look at a particular talent, are we not? That's right. Now, this talent is quite frankly one of the most useful for players, assuming the GM is doing what they need to do when creating difficulties. Um, It's extremely versatile, um, a great value for the XP spent, and a key talent that module and content creators should keep at the top of their mind when writing. And that talent is called Knack for It. Indeed. And the reason we are diving into Knack for It tonight is because of its versatility. But more importantly, um, in conversations that we've had with other creators and players out there who kind of cut their teeth on the Star Wars RPG, Mm -hmm. they're used to this kind of a talent. But this talent is a stark departure in many ways from the similar talents that are found in FFG Star Wars RPG. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and unfortunately, many of those players who did cut their teeth on Star Wars, they have this sort of ingrained perception about knack for it mm. um, because they're used to setback die reducing talents in Star Wars. Yep. Um, when it, it's clear when you get to know this talent, the Genesis creators very obviously decided to take a very different tact. Mm. And you, um, as a GM or a player, and certainly as a creator, should be aware of it. Mm. Indeed. All right, Chris, so let's discuss the ins and outs of Knack for It, um, how it's different from some perceptions uh, and what that means for players, GMs, and content writers. Let's do it. Mm. So what what is this talent, Huli? What is it? What does it do? Okay, so it's a tier one talent. Um, it's found on page 73 of the Genesis Core rulebook for those following on at home. Um, and, um, what it basically does, um, something very, very simple, uh, you can buy multiple times. It is a rank talent, which means that you can, um, the second time you do it, it's a tier two, third time, tier three, et cetera, et cetera. So the first time is only going to be a beautiful five points worth of XP. And additionally, it affects one skill. Uh, and then the second time that you buy it, um, it, it affects two skills and then the third time, another two skills, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens is you remove two setback die from those skills that have been applied to that talent, uh, which is it's a bit of a change from Star Wars because there was a lot of talents which were appearing in different parts of the tree, which were just the same talent. It's just remove one setback die and a lot of the time there'll be, and it does something else that's kind of cool as well. Yeah, and I think that's a clear distinction for Knack for it because unlike Star Wars, more multiple ranks in Knack for it, like like if I, if I select a skill like Streetwise, mm. okay, for Knack for it, and I and I get another rank, as as Huli said, it doesn't. More ranks do not do not allow me to reduce more setback die. Mm. Um, instead, you know, as you said, each extra rank allows you to select two additional skills to apply that existing two setback dice reduction to. Mm. And so, I mean, for, I mean, and let's put this in perspective as well, because you know, as well as I do from the Star Wars RPG, mm. that, you know, if, if I, if I had a setback reducing talent that might appear three times in a tree, mm. um, it would be scattered in quite a few places. Mm. And if I happen to get all three ranks, man, I could reduce up to three setback dice mm. on for that particular skill. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this one, I mean, because of the way talents are handled in Genesis and we have the pyramid, you know, if you take a tier one and a tier two for 15 XP worth of talents, mm. that's two, that's two ranks of knack for it. Mm. You get to ignore two setback dice on three completely different skills. Right. And that, that is a very different mechanic and honestly return on income investment from an XP standpoint for characters. Mm. Um, 
ultimately it also means that since you you'll you'll max out at five ranks of this you can only ever take five ranks obviously mm-hmm. um that that you, you if you were crazy enough to do it you could maximize this talent by applying it to nine skills mm. and that's that's insane yep now the um, one catch though is that you can't apply yes. it to combat skills and you can't apply it to magic skills which is really really important for game balance i think uh, and they've, they've certainly chosen well uh, by limiting it with those. Um, and it does mean that there may be other talents later on down the track that, uh, that do affect that. And I know that there are some uh, that uh, yes. with, with regards to magic. But they're very, very specific um, what they do and under what circumstances that they work. Because messing around with those two, you know, that can definitely yeah, break the balance of the game. It absolutely can. It absolutely can. And and this really also highlights the difference between Genesis and Star Wars. Mm. Um, you know, we've we've talked about it lightly, but you know the the very in the Star Wars RPG, there there's all the very specializations specializations are littered with individual talents like this, right? And they all have different names, mm. and and each one is ranked, and each one lets you focus on a specific skill or maybe occasionally two skills, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and each rank in those talents would let you increase the number of setback dice you could ignore. Mm. Um, but but Knack Four, it's different. It's got this generic focus, mm. which I think it is. Look, I can't, I, and I know that I've spoken to other people that sort of uh, really don't like knack, um, knack for it at all, which I don't understand. Yeah. It's just like that is, I'm at least going to take that with any character at the start. If I've got five XP left over after character creation, it's going on knack for it, and it's going on the skill that I've really focused on. Um, yes. You know, and uh, hey, look, you know, as somebody pointed out to me, um, vigilance is a great one. It sure it's a um, uh, it's a skill. It's it's part of combat, but it's not a combat skill. So if you're if you're the sort of uh, player who or your GM is someone who does like to add setback die um, or difficulties rather than just a simple check for initiatives. It's brilliant for that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, Knack for it becomes fairly self-obvious for skillful characters if Ooh. I'm playing that type of character. Yep. Um, you know, especially somebody with an academic bent or a, a technological bent. Um, but um, the the most under-recognized archetypes, uh, or excuse me, not archetypes, but career types that can make advantage of this Ooh. are, from a combative standpoint, you might, well, I'm not a skillful character. Yeah, dude. Vigilance and cool, okay? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> okay, do, do, do it. Um, perception, okay? Fantastic choice that anyone can do this with. Um, but then also, uh, I, and this has been a kind of this is kind of a weird thing because it seems very obvious to me. But mm. but when people think of skillful careers, they think of of careers that align with you know uh, in Star Wars it would be the smuggler, or the scoundrel, right? In in fantasy settings it would be the rogue, okay? Mm. Or the uh, the technician or the computer slicer or or the academic scholar. Mm. But honestly, an incredibly skillful character is also um, a career theme I would call the survivalist. Mm. Okay. So these are your rangers, okay? Yep. Your 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 druids, your explorers, okay? That um, you know, and when when you look at that skills like ride or survival, mm. okay incredibly important to apply this to. And then let's also not forget that this has incredible value if you are a jockey of any kind. If you are a pilot or a driver, you best be taking this talent mm. uh, for those key skills. Absolutely. And I think the same thing applies to, uh, you mentioned survival. I mean, there is another talent that is there which does remove setback. It's not a, a rank talent. But it is a talent that removes it. So you could end up removing, and I, I think it's foraging, um, that you can remove three setback die if you've got uh, set up for survival. So, you know, there's there's a lot of advantages there with uh, with combos too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. freaking mm. um, Yeah. And, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, and I think a lot of people who don't like the talent, mm. um, they're concerned because 
especially if you come from Star Wars, it's like, wait a minute. So it's cool that you start off by being able to ignore two setback dice. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's cool because that means that a beginner character with a five XP investiture rank Mm -hmm. in knack for it ignores two setback dice on a skill, which is a much cheaper benefit, much faster than they would see in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. But I think their hesitation comes from the fact that a character with a thousand earned XP can mm. still never go beyond those two ignored setback dice for that skill yep. in most cases, unless mm. you have an odd talent like foraging, right? Mm. Um, you know, they can only ever buy more skills that the talent applies to. Mm. But this actually matters and is a very careful design choice, in my opinion, for a couple reasons. Mm. And it really has to do with game balance. Mm-hmm. Now, the first, I guess, is the number of setback die designed to be in a check. Now, in Star Wars, uh, the sky was basically the limit, uh, and it should be pointed out that this rule changed for Star Wars at around about the same time that Genesis was released. So that gives you a bit of an idea as to their uh, FFG's mindset when it comes to that too many setback die can be way too much. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, a bit of a caveat, though. This first point has everything to do with defense. Now, we realize that knack for it does not apply to combat skills, but it's still worth noting that this is still a bit of a rule of thumb. Basically, try and keep your number of setback die in a check to four. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we know we're probably going a little bit more into um, how to run a game, more so than we are the talent. Um, but basically, that's when you're designing your adventures, that's what you should be looking at as well. Yes. Now, there's obviously going to be uh, exceptions to the rule, uh, especially when you're applying setback dive for uh, like wind and rain and cover uh, when it comes to perception, for example. Um, but the aim should always be generally for setback dive per check. And another reason is that you only get four setback die. In two packs of dice from (laughs) FFG. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing which is important when it comes to this is from an actual roleplay perspective that you've got the language there from just knack for it that will give you that realization that your character has a specific set of skills that they can remove that and they can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at this and I'm pretty well known for being good at this. Um, and so that can sort of drive the narrative as well. Absolutely. So, okay, to, to really wrap this discussion up, and mm. I think one of the real reasons I wanted to focus on it for, for this show yep. is what does this talent mean for GMs and for content creators? Mm. Because, because whether you realize it or not, it matters. Yep, I agree. So for GMs, it's pretty simple. It means that if you if your players have um, strong means to ignore setback die very often, use setback die. Use them often. Um, I can't talk more highly about setback die being probably one of the best mechanics in the game. And I know that um, we on the Dice Pool uh, did an entire episode um, dedicated to uh, setback die and how to use them. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's still available. Go and have a listen to that. Um, so, yeah, definitely use them often. Uh, for content creators, this means accounting for anatomic environmental circumstances um, frequently in adventure modules. So, yes. uh, you know, just make sure that they're there, always there. Um, you know, get your players used to uh, when they're asking what's the difficulty of a check. Get them used to going, are there any setback die with that? Because uh-huh. that, can, that can then remind um, players that oh, and the GM to add them. I know that I've heard stories where they have uh, GMs have got their GM screen and they've got a little note, uh, just a post note, which says, you know, add setback die, just to, uh, mm-hmm. to remind them to do that. Because sometimes it can, especially if you're you know, doing a three, four hour session, and you do happen to forget those sorts of things, that put them in, make sure that that, because nothing ever happens in a vacuum when it comes down to it. There is always a reason for a setback. Absolutely, absolutely. Now on the creator's end, 
the real sticking point, and and honestly, one of the primary reasons that I'm so hot on this topic mm. is because of that last. You mentioned this earlier that we'd come to it. Mm. That last big point in the knack for it talent, you cannot select combat or magic skills as your skill choices for this talent, right? Mm. Right. So let's pull back the curtain and talk about why that is. Mm. Because it matters in the content you create. Hmm. From a game balance and a design perspective, combat skills and magic skills are used during combat encounters. Right. And ignoring setback dice in those situations on those checks, I mean, yes, environmental circumstances are going to cause setback dice. But do you know what else adds setback dice to a check in combat, Huli? Armor? Cover? <laughs> <laughs> exactly and those are things that you do you, like it, it is it is freakishly imbalanced to ignore yeah. based on a talent especially one that only costs you five xp mm. um the point guys is that those combat encounter mechanics are beyond well play tested balanced and good so don't mess with them right and how and why would you want to mess with them and where does it come to play um Huli, it comes it, it comes down for at least for me to custom skills. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now this uh, this mechanical balance is is important, so don't forget it. Creators, when you're creating and modifying new skills, uh, if the skill is highly likely to be used as a primary skill in combat encounters, then knack for it should not be allowed for those skills. Things mm-hmm. like superpowers. Things like alternative combat skills, such as those found in Keith Gapple's Ready Fight. Exactly. Exactly. And, <clears throat> I mean, and he's got alternative combat skills. I've seen people create alternative combat skills or additional combat skills. Um, I was reading online, some guy basically created the equivalency of something for exotic weaponry in his mm-hmm. campaign. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, okay, you need to not allow knack for it to apply. Yep. And. I, I, I can't speak for others, but I know so like in, in my setting guides, um, and, and including familiar that you'll find on the foundry, um, I actually go so far, at, I mean, w- when it's appropriate to call out, okay, hey, these are existing talents that are in the core rulebook mm-hmm. that need to be modified slightly. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, I'm working, uh, and I've got those sections in there. I'm working on another setting right now uh, that involves superheroic powers, and there are three brand new power skills that I've added to the skill set to the skill list, mm-hmm. and I had to make a modification noted in my campaign setting guide. Saying, "Hey guys, knack for it, um, yeah, it, you, you can't you you can't apply knack to it, knack for it to, you know, combat skills and power skills. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's no magic in my setting, but there's powers. Yep. Yep. So." You know, you, you got you got to make that distinction and be very well aware of it. Absolutely. And probably one last point, especially when people who were designing settings or designing sort of new archetypes that uh, any sort of anything that has a new talent in it, don't create talents that have removed setback die unless it's under very, yeah. very specific circumstances um, and as long as it's not a ranked talent. You just want to avoid that if you can. Absolutely. I mean, so far I'm only aware of the one, that foraging talent that does it. Mm -hmm. And honestly, let's be, let's be clear. It only works under specific circumstances. Yep. And it specifically calls out a very specific skill that honestly doesn't get a lot of love or use. And that's survival. That's right. So, so I I think it's, it's, it's there. But Mm. Anyway, I hope, we hope you guys have enjoyed this discussion. It, honestly, and as time goes on, right now, if you guys have a particular skill or a particular talent that you'd like us to dig into in this segment, be sure to let us know. Email us, forgegenesis at d20radio.com, or simply head to our Facebook page, at Forge Genesis, and uh, you know, shoot us a message. Indeed. Post it up. We want to know. Absolutely. Well, I think we have a special guest waiting for us in the wings who <gasps> I'm dying to talk I- to. Um, so should we get on to that? I would. I have been waiting to get on to that. I am so excited. Let's do it. Awesome. So let's talk um, to our special guest um, in the furnace. The furnace. And welcome to the furnace, the segment where we take a deep dive into a topic concerning custom creations using the Genesis role playing game. And for our second episode, we thought it best to dive a little bit deeper into the ins and outs of the Genesis Foundry as we talk more deeply about the process of good 
content creation, whether it's for the Foundry or for your games at home. And to that end, we are proud to welcome a special guest, a developer for Fantasy Flight Games and the Point Man, per Sam Stewart anyway, uh, for bringing the Foundry into the world, Mr. Tim Huckleberry. Huck, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Huck, we're really grateful you took the time to be here. Um, you know, for, for us and the Genesis community and our listeners, thank you. Mm. Um uh, now, you've been a guest of mine on the Order 66 podcast. I actually went back and counted five times <laughs> um, <laughs> over the years. But many of the, the Forge's listeners are, are discovering you um, and, and, and Genesis and the Narrative Dice system for the very first time. Um, and for those new listeners, perhaps if you're willing, we could uh, take a few moments to uh, ask you a few questions and get to know you a little better. Certainly. Certainly. So all right, <laughs> all right then. So, 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 tell us who, who, just, just who are you, and what do you do for Fantasy Flight? Uh, well, yeah, my name's Tim Huckleberry. Uh, I've been with FFG for plus or minus eight years now, uh, working in role play pretty much the whole time with Sam uh, and Tim and Lexus and other people like Katrina uh, and Max and Andy and Tim Flanders as well. So. Uh, yeah, basically, I'm here making roleplay games. Very cool. Now, how did you get into gaming in the first place? Um, probably long, long ago. Uh, <laughs> board games, mostly. Um, and date myself with, like, the original Talisman and Axis and Allies and Diplomacy. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> and card games, when that meant Bridge and Euchre. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, then I got into roleplaying with, like, AD&D uh paranoia first edition mm, um there's a love <laughs> and then uh then i really discovered miniatures games and with games workshop for about 13 years uh after i got out of the military right and uh, while i was within game with games workshop uh started writing for the original dark heresy mm-hmm. and then went on to uh join ffg uh, uh and continue to writing for uh uh, freelancing for FFG when they got the license and then joined FFG. Wow. That's quite the storied career, sir. Well, okay, so you're an old <laughs> pro. You're you're an old pro and, and a bit of a role player. When it comes to themes, and we love asking this question of our guests, especially when it comes to Genesis, when it comes to themes and settings, what is your first love of Genesis? What What style of game do you like to get on the table when you get a chance to play? Um, probably science fiction in any way, shape, or form would be my first choice, but I like, I like trying something new all the time. Um, I'm actually itching to run some games with some of the new settings, uh, that the Expla- uh, Expanded Player's Handbook has, uh, which I wrote one of, so, um, Ooh. yeah, so, uh, yeah, excited to roll those out onto some people. Very cool. <laughs> Now, look, I, I would be amiss, and I know what the answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask, care to share? <laughs> um, well, actually, I don't think it's a problem. We have announced the Monster World setting. And nice. So, yeah, that was me. Right. Um, I worked on the nice. horror setting for the core book, and uh, when we were talking about new things, and that one came up, and basically sort of Sam's turn to me with sort of the, yeah, if you don't, uh, if I don't let you do this, you're going to be really upset. So why don't you do this? Yes, I, exactly. I want to do this. <laughs> and uh, being involved in the playtest, I can say it's really cool. It's probably one of my favorite um, sections out of it. Uh, so uh, well done. I didn't realize that was thanks, yours. So thanks. well done. Yeah, it, was, it was great fun. And that's something we do a lot in the office is when we're working on a book, if we know someone has a particular interest uh, or skill set or both, it's like, hey, you know, you want to tackle this bit? Um and uh, yeah, it's generally it's it's obviously more work for that person, but it's fun work. Uh, and generally, you do it you know off hours and whatnot. But it's it's yeah. great fun to do those things. Very cool. So Tim, you were really the the point man for the Foundry project uh, on a personal level. I I can attest to that. Uh, as we launch content, um, uh, we were in constant communication with you uh, as we worked um, to direct all of our efforts together as a group and it seemed like quite 
um, quite the undertaking. <laughs> well, I got to say, it was quite the undertaking for everybody. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Well, what can you tell us about the creation of the foundry? I mean, was it? I know it was an undertaking for everybody, but from your end, was this was this the equivalent of herding cats? Well, basically, it started. I'm sure, and Sam talked about this a little bit too. This is something we've been like pushing for and, and trying to make happen. Hmm. And uh, Sam has been like working for it and pitching it. And then you know we got the go ahead. You know, yeah, let's do this. And uh, Sam was tied up a bunch of other stuff, and I had a little time. So yeah, no, why don't you sort of again, like you said, take the lead. Um, which was, you know, in a kind of way, almost like working on a book. Um, we contacted writers. Uh, we worked with our graphic design department. We worked with our art department uh, to put together sort of this thing that evolved up uh, from people, all their wonderful creations people did. Um, our graphic design department, you know, we worked on the graphic design template. Uh, art department found all sorts of wonderful pieces of art for us to use for it. Um, and it all sort of came together. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're very happy overall with how it went, but the herding cats, eh, it was a fun way, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it onerous at all because it's always delightful seeing what people were coming up with the, the ideas they had and then the final products they created. Yeah, absolutely. And there's some amazing products that, that have, uh, that came out in the initial, uh, offering and certainly continue to do so. Uh, with uh, with some of the stuff that we talked about earlier in the episode. Um, now, what was it like working for, for One Bookshelf or, or Drive Through RPG, as it's probably better known? Uh, and what did they bring to the table and, and the process? Um, it was great. Uh, met a lot of fun new people. Uh, and obviously, while this all was brand new for us, this was in no way new for them. Hmm. So they had lots of expertise in like how to make this happen, uh, which... And, and literally answering questions before we had them sometimes. Mm. So that was very mm. welcome on our side because of them, other than that sort of thing, yeah, this is a good thing. We should do this. What do we do now? And that's where they came of, oh, you need to do this, this, and this, and we'll need that, that, and that. And oh, by the way, you should probably do this as well. It's like, yeah, I'll start scribbling notes real quick. <laughs> so they were great. Hmm. And have been great, too. It's not a past tense at all. Absolutely. Okay, well, what about the launch content creators? Um, oh, you know, they you all say, suck. Terrible, terrible <laughs> people. <My God. laughs> I, 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 remember, I remember getting the communication in the springtime, and it was like, okay, well, this is happening. Um, you know, but, uh, I mean, yeah, you I, – I, I mean, I mean I'm, yeah, I'm curious to get your, your take on this because we were a pretty – darn demanding bunch uh, <laughs> uh, peppering you pretty much nonstop uh, with some pretty detailed questions. Mm. And it was great because, again, a lot of those are questions we hadn't thought of, um, especially in terms <laughs> of what, because I know what I need to make a book for Fantasy Flight Games in terms of graphic design elements and other things, but finding out what other people need, knowing not at all what you had on your side, Mm. Uh, it was great, and it sort of forced us to rethink and go back. So, oh, okay, yeah, we've always just sort of done it this way, but that's how we've done it. How are other people going to do this? Mm. So that was that was great. I mean, it, it it yeah, it kept me on my toes. But they're all great questions, and uh, hopefully, we resolved a lot of them. Because um, at the end of the day, we wanted this to be something that people we could provide people with really cool tools uh, to make really cool products. And the resources that were provided or that, that are available are absolutely amazing. Um, so, uh, you know, to, and that just allows people to create uh, products which, you know, is, you know, in some cases on par with, um, with uh, the direction that FFG tries to take. So definitely. Well, we kind of viewed it in the same way like Genesis is a bunch of tools to make really cool things, so we want to mm. provide people with other kinds of tools to, again, make really cool things. Absolutely. <laughs> so tell us about the launch. Um, obviously, all happening at Gen Con. Uh, how were you, <laughs> what were you feeling during that whole, whole process? Sweating bullets? Um, uh, breathing a sigh of relief uh, as it got announced? Uh, I was watching it live on, uh, on uh, YouTube. And uh, yeah, the the announcement was was 
was fantastic and I've sort of had my finger on the button with a few things um, from our end. Uh, but uh, So how did you feel about that, uh, that whole process happening? Well, we've been working, like you mentioned, like through the spring, uh, early summer, and sort of like, okay, yeah, we, roughly this time period, we think we can roll it out. And then, uh, then I heard that, oh, yeah, we're going to announce it at Gen Con as part of the in-flight report. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay, yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so obviously that's set a deadline, which is good because other things just meander around and otherwise. Mm. But mm. Uh, the decision to make it part of the in-flight, that was wonderful because it really, yeah, we got the word out in a big way uh, to a packed hall. Uh, and that was wonderful, and having uh, a lot of the creators sitting with us, uh, cheering it on. Uh, it was a nice moment and really made the show for me, and hopefully for everybody else. <laughs> Have you had the chance? I, I know it's probably still too early to even ask. Uh, uh, most people are still recovering from the con. <laughs> but have you had the chance to get any Foundry content on the table yet? Um, yeah, actually at Gen Con, uh, Phil ran a Starkana game. Oh, uh, nice. I leave early on, but had a blast playing, and... Uh, I have a date set uh, to basically go in and get a bunch more things and run some games at the office. Uh, and I think <laughs> some of the other people here are going to do the same. <laughs> Very cool. Well, um, we're actually we've actually got uh, Phil and uh, and Kimber Bowen um, coming onto the podcast uh, on this episode later on to actually oh. talk about Anna. So well, I will say hi, hi, Phil. Hi. Uh, so you see, cut that this out. Is a, and paste this is, it into their bit. This isn't a fourth wall break. It's like a fifth wall break. It's it's <laughs> saying hi across segments. Yeah. Uh, that's dude. that's 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 crazy. Okay, so Huck, as we talk about the launch and Gen Con, one of the reasons we were also keen to get you on our second episode is due to the uh, tizzy. That happened with the community <laughs> content agreement during launch. Um, in short, there were a few mistakes in the initially published agreement um, that seemed to contradict what was previously communicated. And it sent the Internet into quite the fandom reaction, mm -hmm. um, at least a few people. Um, Maybe three. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> the three people, I think specifically. Yeah. Um, we we uh, uh we would love the opportunity, if you're willing to, to get some clear guidance from you um, on the content agreement, the recent incredibly clarifying updates, and to clear up any lingering questions. If that would be okay. Sure, I will try my best. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, we wrote up legal stuff. We used a lot of the existing legal stuff because it was existing, and we knew that was good. And there were mistakes, and we didn't catch them in time. And unfortunately, since everybody who was involved was at Gen Con, it's been tough getting those mistakes corrected in the days since then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, at launch, it, it was clear there were some like mistakes and or copy-paste errors in the agreement um, that pretty much seemed to indicate that, that, you know, one bookshelf or FFG would retain like heavy rights to a creator's content beyond just the genesis related material and that obviously goes against what we as content creators were told initially and i think what sam actually said on this very mm. show um <laughs> yeah. um mere hours after the uh the 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 um the in-flight report mm. um you know and and you know but i'm impressed because within a matter of days i mean you a, a first draft was updated again on on drive through rpg um, and it even went through a second revision uh, later, which I and, and which I know there's still there's still another revision that's that's there waiting to come up um, to make things absolutely clear. Um, but I mean, to to clarify for our listeners and people that may have witnessed some of this concern online, can you clarify this updated agreement for us? I mean, for the Genesis community, can you clarify how content rights? work for our submitted materials what what do we creators retain the rights to what don't we retain the rights to uh, well first off if you create something like a new ip it's your ip i mean that's straight up and but i think sam covered this as well so basically i'm just going to reiterate almost what sam said because that's really what should have been in the legal document mm. um mm. but it's your it's your ip um i mean yeah there are certain things like whatever you create for the genesis foundry can only be on the Genesis Foundry. Um, that's, I mean, you can't turn around and shop it around anywhere else. Um, but there's a lot of things, and actually we're working on a little FAQ to answer a lot of these as well, concerning like 
Uh, well, for example, um, if uh, you do a setting book for original IP and then want to do a conversion for another system, cool, great, have fun. Um, you, if you want to make it part of another program's community thing, um, as long as that community program is okay with that, yeah, go for it. Um, but uh, basically, at the at the end of the day, if you create IP, it's your IP. Mm. So, as as a creator, who decides to publish? Um, uh, you know, who decides to publish on the forum on on the foundry? Sorry. Um, and let's say it's a setting. So it's a setting of my own design, my own intellectual property. Um, from what you've said there, um, it's still mine after it's published. Uh, what else can I do with that IP? Um, quite a bit. I mean, I don't want to say anything because I'm sure there's something that could be weird. <laughs> right. But if you want to uh, do other things with it, that's great. I mean, again, the big thing is, if you create something for the Foundry, it can only be on the Foundry in terms of that specific creation. Right. That that particular product itself. Yeah. So if I want to if I want to go write a novel or create a screenplay. <laughs> no nope, screenplays and, right out. That's what, that's that's mine in particular. That <laughs> <laughs> it does it does depend what streaming service you're going to put it on though. Right. <laughs> So, yes, we retain the rights to our IP. We can do anything we want to, but the individual product that we have chosen to publish on the Foundry belongs on the Foundry. Yeah, and again, the uh, the revised legal document that will go up will go into tight legalese about all this. Hmm. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, and if the, a related question that kind of came up, and maybe you can answer this, maybe you can't, maybe, maybe you can just refer us to the document, but uh, what protects my product from being used elsewhere i mean as an example i create a setting and then somebody without my permission decides to create a module for it and maybe publish it on the foundry uh you should probably do something about that yourself <laughs> <laughs> not it sounds kind of flippant but it is your ip so you have to protect it and, and thank you for that yeah and i mean that is something which is quite clear in in my opinion anyway in uh in the documentation that's been provided you the onus is up to you to protect your own stuff. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have to protect our stuff. So, mm. you know, you've got your stuff, you've got to protect your stuff. Well, I think that sort of, yeah, that, that pretty much clears all of that up, <laughs> to yeah, be honest. Again, I mean, it, it, was, it was, again, it was great that all this happened at Gen Con, but at the same time, it, literally everybody who was, who was neck deep into it was at Gen Con. Yeah. So it was awfully tough to try to, to quickly fix things. But bear with us. Hopefully, maybe even by the time you listen to this, uh, it's all been corrected. Absolutely. Cool. <laughs> all right. Because at the end of the day, we want to, I mean, we didn't, we did this program to allow people to do great stuff. And we don't want to get in the way or have anybody feel that, uh, that we're uh, somehow getting, like, using their, taking their stuff away from them. Yeah. And that's not the point of it at all. Absolutely. So now that that's all clarified, we'd really like to dig into the process of, of content creation with you, if that's okay, uh, and sure. leverage your knowledge and expertise for the listeners. Uh, now, whether someone is looking to publish on the Foundry or simply craft some best-in-class content for their own table um, to get that wow factor, we'd, we'd love to dive into some advice and potential resources uh, for content creators that you can provide us. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So we mentioned this earlier briefly uh, and, and kind of danced around it, but let's talk about it directly because this is something else we've, we've only ever talked about briefly. And I, I, I'm shocked by what's been provided. Um, but there are numerous resources that FFG has provided for us creators. Templates, guidelines, font packages, art packs, I mean, can you can you tell us about the resources available to help people create their work? Because it was a process, man. I mean, people don't realize those of us who were working initially. I mean, I mean, I I was just amazed. You were coming out with updates to that, you know, every week practically. Mm. I don't know how many versions you, you guys went through. Yeah, the, the graphic design template in particular was it was it was one of those things probably we would never have done otherwise, uh, but it was a good thing we did um, because I mean. 
our graphic design templates, our graphic design department is awesome uh, as we go from project to project. And a lot of times there's stuff that's just like buried in the attic of some of the templates that, well, it's who cares if it's there? We're not using it. It's just, it'll sit. It's no big deal. But when we looked at what we were going to provide, it's like, wow, we really need to tighten all this up and clean it up and sort things and organize things better. And, and again, make sure after we stripped out all this other stuff, make sure it still works, uh, that we didn't, you know, pull that one little bit that's tied to all sorts of other little bits. Um, and then do things like include instructions where we could, which obviously we know how to use these things. We never need instructions. <laughs> uh, or if we do, we just talk to a graphic designer who's working with us and they're, like, no, 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 this does this, this, and this, and you attach that and hit this button and it works great. Mm. Um, so that was that was really <laughs> educational for us in ways, almost like writing game rules for using all this stuff. And then we put those out almost like you were the play testers, really, yep. and came back with, oh, hey, wait a second, this says this, but over there it says that. What's up here? It's, oh, yeah, we need to fix that. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a great process. Um, and as we and it's not a fixed process as we evolve and find other things we can add or find things that people. Uh, hey, wait a second. This this isn't quite working right. Oh, yeah, we should go in and fix that. So the templates will continue to be updated as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Same Fantastic. thing with everything else, like the uh, the fonts and the links of the graphical elements, mm -hmm. uh, possibly even more art collections as time goes on, too. True. So as far as the documentation that has been done, you just mentioned it briefly then. That would have been a task within itself to uh, to get all of that that process because, as you say, it's something that you guys just do automatically now because you've been doing it for so long. Uh, but to to have that there as a resource is absolutely fantastic. And and I know as someone who's never really used InDesign up until recently, um, I have to say thank you for for uh, for that step by step process. It's great. Yeah, it was, again, it was like one of those little exercises, like, you know, describe, you know, write down how to tie shoelaces. Well, <laughs> you don't have to write that down. Everybody knows how to do that. Well, going through and writing it up, it, it made for good documentation, and mm. it'll probably be good training aids uh, for new people coming into the company using InDesign and other things like that, too. Mm. Uh, so, it was, yeah, it was, it was a good process. Uh, one of those, uh, you, you learn a bit just by going back and really thinking why you're doing the things you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. hey, if if uh, if you know you ever get tired of of you know writing RPGs, um, you know you always have a bright career in software technical documentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually did that a bit in the Air Force writing training manuals. So yeah, right. That, actually, thinking about it, that was probably how I got started in role play was writing sim writing and conducting simulations. So wow, there you go. There's a story there. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was fun i mean even doing the style guide which um it was more of an afterthought and a lot of people frankly said you know that's cute but i don't plan on following the style but it's still it was educational for us to really sit down and clean up and and really make what we thought was a nice tight style guide mm. oh i found it i found it incredibly helpful and what was interesting to me is i use some of it but not all of it because my setting was very intentionally quirky um, and so I, I wanted it to have its own flavor and feel, but then there were some details in the style guide, especially how, how certain things are referenced, what things are bolded and what are not. And you, you go through, it's like, mm. Oh yeah, well, God, yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that in my, <laughs> in my prop. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, just for that consistency, yep. you know, even if you're not using the same necessarily fonts, um, or other stylistic choices, little fundamental core minor things like that, um, can really serve to connect, uh, you know, custom created content with the official content uh, that's you know published by Fantasy Flight. Mm -hmm. So, well, and and hopefully also even if you're not following it, maybe it's a good template to create your own style guide for your own layouts mm -hmm. and styles. Oh, uh, look at this magnanimous man right here! <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, but it, we found it to be a really effective tool uh, for our writers, especially when they're applying styles. Uh, that we then turn around and use an InDesign. Mm. Very much so. Can attest to that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, but I mean, that's something that that I think, 
as a just doing a little bit of writing uh, other than what I've done for FFG. Just having that as the basis of, of how I do everything. It's just I know how it's going to be set out. And it's also if you need to send it to anybody else who's familiar with that, you're gonna they're going to be getting it in the same style. So they know what to expect. They're not going to have 40 different ways of doing the same sort of thing. They, they know that most people are going to be used to that, um, that template, which is good. All right, so we've talked about, um, uh, you know, InDesign, and we know that the templates are available um, in both InDesign and PDF. Now, InDesign is a little bit pricey, unfortunately. Um, thank you, Adobe. Um, not to mention uh, you need a certain unique skill set uh, to be able to utilize uh, the power of it. Has there been any thoughts to making templates available in other programs at all? Um, to be honest, not so much. Okay. It would probably require us here to get another program and then right. learn it and right. then turn around and write, <laughs> do the same thing again. Mm. Um, and in the meantime, Sam would probably be yelling at me as to why I'm doing all that when I've got a book to finish up. <laughs> so uh, pr- it, I'll be honest, I don't see it happening mm. I don't, I don't see it happening, but it's still, I mean, I won't say it can't happen, mm. but it might be, again, something cool for somebody else out there to work up. Well, surprisingly enough, I can um, attest to uh, Scott uh, Zamold from uh, yes. Don't Despair, who has done exactly that for, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the, the program, uh, but it is a free piece of software. Um, that uh, that he's um, stepped through that process. So, you know, he's a bit of a whiz when it comes to InDesign and, uh, you know, he's obviously in his spare time decided he wants to do another one. So uh, so well no, done, I, Scott, for that. It's great. I think, that's, I think that's wonderful. And I think I saw somewhere that someone had actually gone through a template and said, well, this is all well and good, but here's how it could be better. It's like, that's fantastic. Mm. I mean, just because that's how we did stuff does not mean it's the best way yeah. or the way everybody has to do it. Mm. So I thought that was a wonderful, basically, yeah, this is, here's here's what it is, but let's really make it a lot better, folks. Mm. That was great. And probably maybe some of those elements will include in another version of the template, too. Mm. You know what I miss? You know what I miss? You know, you know what kind of chaps my hide, really makes me upset? I really wish we had more dedication and, and engagement from our fan community, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> having, having said all that, though, I mean, I, I love InDesign. Um, and if I can make it work, I mean, it's, it's not that tricky. There's tons of stuff to teach you how to use it. Um, for me, I would say it's not the, the, the program. It's just you're going to need, frankly, probably a really good computer to put it on. Mm-hmm. Mm. True. I mean, we've got really nice ones. The company, you know, gives us really good app uh, tools to work with. Um, but I can't, uh, I would have a tough time uh, working with it maybe at home. But I have a really, like, low-end computer at home too, so. Yeah. The hardest part, I think, with InDesign is because it's Adobe. And, um, you know, Adobe wants to uh, literally charge you an arm and leg uh, for it. Um, just as a side note for anyone, and I don't think I'm telling any stories out of school here, uh, that um, uh, for anyone who is wanting to use Adobe InDesign um, and doesn't want to pay the exorbitant price point, uh, you can get a student version. So if you are a student or if you have a student in your household, like a 16-year-old or 15-year-old, um, you can actually set it up. Uh, to have a lower price point. Um, you, it's still a little bit expensive, but um, look, you, you just have to throw it into your budget, basically, uh, for, uh, for you know, your, your content creation or your own little studio. So, hmm. Yeah, I mean, that'll be the same as budgeting for art or proofreaders yeah. or editors or any play testers even, possibly. So that's just something to factor into the, uh, the creation. Exactly. Yeah. And, I mean, there's a whole heap of other programs as well. You get the full yep. version of Acrobat. You get Audition. So, you know, if you want to start your own little podcast, uh, that uh, you can do all of that as well. There's, there's a whole heap of stuff uh, that is, is quite useful. So, um, but anyway. Again, i got to say, InDesign is really fun to work with. Mm. I do love it. And I'm in no way, like, into – I mean, I learned this all at FFG. 
Yeah. So it's I really do enjoy it. Um, and I use it like at work for all sorts of other things that probably in the past I would have just done in Word or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we've <clears throat> we've been talking about this and this is really good technical crunchy stuff. But I mean, Huck, you're you're a guy who's been writing for the RPG industry for a very, very long time. Um, and just through this process, you know, with us content creators, you've been reviewing our work, you've been dealing with us, and I think you're in a, in a very strong and maybe even unique position to, to give a set of advice. And I mean, to that end, Greenfield, man, what advice do you have for content creators and aspiring content creators out there? Um, no, that's a good question. Uh, I think the for especially doing things for the program, do something, obviously, and this may be go without saying, do something that you're actually enthusiastic about doing, um, whatever it is. Um, you know, make something that is, you know, if it's your little pet project or whatever, um, have, have fun doing it. Be enthusiastic about it. Um, make it. Make it a creation that, like, look back and say, yeah, I'm really happy I did this. As opposed to just sort of like, well, one of these days maybe I'll do this. But yeah, go to it. Uh, make something that's a lot of fun. Uh, first off, I mean, if you're not having fun doing it, probably you shouldn't be. Uh, so make something that that's you're really going to enjoy a, a lot. Having said that, though, yeah, bounce the ideas off other people. Um, see what people are wanting. Uh, see what people are asking. Boy, it'd be cool if this existed. And maybe look at something like that, too. Um, those would be right off the bat. I mean, again, these may be blindingly obvious to everybody out there. Um, for the other bits, uh, make sure, well, you probably don't have a set deadline for anything. So take your time, uh, do more play testing than you think is needed, uh, get multiple people to look at it. Um, especially just to look through your final layout. Is it easy to read? Is it enjoyable to read? Um, you know, is, is there every now and then some pieces of art or something to break up just lots and lots of text? Is your graphic design style fun and easy to follow? And that's where just other eyes will be really good. But yeah, take your time a little bit. You, again, we have deadlines all the time, but you probably don't. So enjoy that. Have fun with it. Uh, what else? Um, <clears throat> play testing, play testing, play testing, especially for <laughs> adventures. Um, one thing that's really easy when you're running something it's very easy when you're running something to make it work because you are three levels into that adventure. Mm-hmm. Give that to somebody cold, sit back and take notes while they run it themselves with no notes and no prompting from you and see mm-hmm. how it goes. And then incorporate those that feedback into your final version. Those are the biggies. I mean, I think everyone probably has lots of other things to pipe in on that. Um, but yeah, try to make sure other people review it uh, if need be, look out. There's lots of great editors and proofreaders uh, you can find uh, who will, again, bringing fresh eyes to it. You know what you wrote. You know what you meant when you wrote it, but other people may not. So, yeah, let other people take a look at it, and professionals too. Mm. Very, very good advice indeed. Now, in your expert opinion, what makes <laughs> for a good product – for the foundry, and I, I, I know that there's obviously a, a fairly wide range now uh, that's uh, that's available from settings to adventures to um, to uh, additional rules to add to any setting. But what do you think um, creates uh, makes for a good product for the foundry? This will be a really interesting question to ask a year from now, by the way, mm. uh, when we can really see uh, who, who was right in what their advice was. <laughs> uh, for me, I think original stuff is going to be the most fun. Right. Uh, creating your own setting, your own neat thing, uh, using maybe just some page in the Genesis core book that had some, here's some ideas that everyone sort of like has glossed over and taking that and going to town and come up with something really unique and fun and different uh, that sort of stands out a little bit, and which is easy to say, but obviously very hard to do. Mm. But for me, yeah, original stuff. Uh, the more original, the better, the more wacky. Um, <laughs> your own, like, boy, I think it'd be cool if there was a setting like this and making it happen. 
I think I have those sorts of feelings on a daily basis and there just isn't enough time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't agree um, with that advice at all. I, ha- I really hate doing unusual things. And- oh, yeah, because familiar is not on a little bit quirky at all, uh, Chris. <laughs> and the second step of that was to maybe follow up with adventures in that setting. Yeah. Yeah. Make it easy for people to dive into it. Maybe some, ad, you know, some pre-gens, uh, other tools, uh, but let people, you know, welcome, welcome those people into your world and see what they do with it. Mm. Excellent. So that, was, that the, was, again, we'll, we'll, we'll redress this a year from now. We'll see how, that, uh-huh. how, uh, how good that was. Yeah. So absolutely. what you're saying is we got, we got a guarantee you're going to come back and talk to us in a year. Yeah. One year from now and March. <laughs> 8.54 Central Time. Right. August 14th or whenever, 29th, 20th. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm in agreement. I, and I'm, I'm interested to see what the next year shows us. But the idea of – and we, we see this with um, – I think the number two hotness on the Foundry right now is actually Starcana, mm. um, which uh, <clears throat> will be – talking about with with phil and camber shortly yeah but they they did a one-two punch at launch and and we're we're seeing this now where you know you release the setting guide and then an immediate adventure afterwards Mm -hmm. and i think that i don't know i I think that one-two punch is a a a bit of a smart move i think Mm -hmm. um for you know if you're going to do a setting follow it with an adventure either the at the same time or immediately thereafter yeah I, i think it's really good because first first off you show them here's this neat world then immediately follow. Here's the kind of thing you can do with it, mm-hmm. or literally just do this right off the bat if you want. But that one adventure probably sparks twenty other adventure ideas. Mm. And people can include little adventure nuggets all the way through their adventures as well to say, "Hey, look, th- we're mentioning this here, but perhaps you can expand on it." And that sort of thing as well. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's at the end of the day, this is all Genesis, so it's very. Here is something cool. What can you do with this? Mm. So yeah, that I mean, yeah. I, I, again, I think it'll be cool to see uh, how this evolves. Uh, we, you know, it's just just been birthed. So let's see where it goes. <laughs> it starts to toddle shortly. First words, are, <laughs> first words are coming. Then we get to have the difficult conversation: the birds, the bees, <laughs> funny smells, and funny places. You know, <laughs> yeah. It'll it'll be it'll be an interesting time. Um, so speaking of funny smells and funny places, that is the, that is the worst segue ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the king of worst segues. <laughs> um, uh, I was like, speaking of funny smells and funny places in your career as a writer, uh, <laughs> um, what are some of the most hard learned lessons you've had as a writer and a creator over the years? What, what nuggets of wisdom can you share with other writers and creators in terms of the process of, of writing and creating? Um, first off, again, this may be kind of obvious, but it's a hard one. It's like you will make mistakes and you will never notice them until your work goes out to the public. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, <laughs> and that's, you know, and you will have people very eager to point out where your mistakes are and smile and thank them and, get them corrected and try not to make them again, mm-hmm. but there will be mistakes. Um, no matter what you do, something always slips through. That's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it's great that people, you know, let us know so we can make it better and, uh, make better products. Um, that's a biggie. But for me, uh, I, tr- I mean, and this is just me personally, maybe a little bit, but I do like to, try to think in ways that are just not going along with the way maybe like look at a rule set it's like well okay this is this is fantastic Genesis is fantastic but um, what if this did something radically different um, what if uh, dice worked a different way what if the symbols interacted differently something just wacky and different uh, like that especially when working up like NPC abilities which should be wacky and different usually mm. in, a, in a fun way um, having said that, try not to go like everything that way. Otherwise, you're just straying too far from the Genesis experience, which for me is that's one of the cool things about Genesis. Like, we can sit down and play anything, any setting, and if it's Genesis, we all know what the, uh, the, the feel of the game in terms of the, how the mechanics are going to interact are going to be, uh, which I do really like about the system. I mean, narrative dice, baby. Love them. Love them. <laughs> 
Oh, they're right. <laughs> I think I think yeah. it might be an episode. I think that might be an episode title right there. Yeah, I mean, I, narrative, I, I, narrative dice, baby. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I mean, I, I I really do love this system. Uh, it it allows every dice roll to be something interesting hmm. uh, and drive the plot in maybe even a way that no one expected. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I guess, and just a uh, uh, one other bit in terms of like when you're creating things. Look in the core book. Look in the player's guide when that comes out. There's a lot of fantastic advice for doing almost everything you can think of um, as a GM in terms of creating new things. And you don't have to follow those slavishly, but at least look at them and see what works for you, see what doesn't. Um, But trust me, there'll be good stuff in both of those books and all the others too, Uh, but especially those two in terms of like really useful tools that again, you may decide, eh, this doesn't quite work for me, but it sparks another great idea. I'll do this instead. Mm. And that'll work even better. Very good. Very, very good advice. Well, Huck, I think we've pretty much tapped your brain as far as, uh, you know, how to uh, to produce product, um, uh, generally about about the foundry. But we've, we do have a couple of, of listener questions that have been fired our way that uh, we'd love to ask you if you've got the time. Let's let's hear them. All right. So we have our first question, which comes from Veronica Leonard of Silverwing Armoury, uh, which you can find at www.silverwingarmoury.com. She asks, I've recently created a blank spell template to help players keep track of more regularly used spells in Genesis. I was selling my work on Etsy, and I wanted to bring that particular product across to the Genesis Foundry. What will I need to do to comply with the Foundry's content policy? Um, I think she almost answered her question right there, (laughs) which is read the content policy and and follow it. Uh, The basics will be, I mean, the product has to include the proper legal dress uh, in terms of like, you know, this is copyright, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's three, it's three paragraphs if I remember right, but I think that's fairly, fairly basic stuff. Mm. Um, and obviously use the logo, uh, in the product as well properly. Um, and yeah, cause I guess if it's art, if it's just blank, it's just like fill in the blanks. There's no like mention of anything, uh, for Genesis on it, then yeah, it's gonna, uh, no matter what it is though, it's gotta have the logo properly used. It's got the legal dress properly used. Mm. Um, those are the biggies. And again, those are spelled out on the guidelines. Hmm. So there you go. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that sounds kind of flippant, I guess, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you, you gotta, you gotta include the legal dress, um, and you gotta include the logo properly. Hmm. Uh, and those are the biggies. And and you can can just go through the foundry and see how all those are used and all the other products. Hmm. Well, I think you bring up a good point. A lot of people have been, uh, in, in some cases selling, uh, but th- things that have been genericized enough that, you know, they're not really, you know, it's like they could be used for multiple things. Genesis being one of them, right? Sure. But, but the instant you decide to enter this particular arena and, and go yeah. with foundry specifically, it's like, okay, this is a different ball game now. It's like, this is a, this is a foundry product. It follows this specific content agreement. It needs to be branded appropriately. It needs to have the appropriate copyright information and legalese in it, on it. Okay. Yep. Um, it and may that's, be, that's, maybe, that's, I mean, uh, I think one other one other product actually just included a, another page to the PDF just for the legal stuff. Hmm. Um, maybe I yep. forget which ones there were, but yeah. So you got to include it in your product. Yep. 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 And um, uh, we're also seeing uh, there's some some interest, so even some of the new stuff that's come up. Uh, one of the more recent things I know we'll talk about in a future episode um, that we we actually mentioned we actually mentioned in the uh, announcements coming up, uh, but it's 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 one of those setting guides that's been published for for numerous different types of settings. And now um, it was actually the the eponymous and ever prolific John Dunn uh, recently cool. published it. Um, yeah, I mean there was that that appropriate update that was there. But you know when you're when you're co- when when you're coming to this particular ballpark, you got you got you got to. You gotta make sure you got your ticket in order. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean the, yeah. the rules are there. Just follow them yeah. uh, and welcome aboard. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. the the big thing to take away is something that we mentioned earlier. Um, was that if she is putting her work um, on the foundry, she has to realize that that's where it will have to stay. 
so it can't be sold anywhere else. Is that correct? Where it, um, if, if it's if it, that particular item, yeah, basically she can't just like remove the foundry stuff and sell it somewhere else because mm-hmm. that would be the the work. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Now again, if she's if she's sort of doing this thing for other programs, that's different. Like she does a variation for it for another RPG. Mm-hmm. That's a different product. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good. Well, hopefully okay. that uh, answers your question, Veronica. And Chris, we have another one as well. Yeah, this was an interesting one uh, from Theo Fattel. Um, he he uh, had a question. He said, "I have a setting I'm developing for Foundry, but I would like some guidance about using NPCs, both stats and names." from other settings slash books. Um, specifically, the, the content guidelines say small rules entries and item profiles, especially for presenting NPC profiles, are permissible. If I wanted to include the stats of a bar guest or a Marriott, for example, in a module that is not specifically set in Terranoth, is that okay? Or would I need to come up with my own scary undead wolf beastie or <laughs> tentacled water horror along with a, a set of stat blocks that are inspired by the originals. Essentially, are adversaries from official FFG products considered IP and therefore not available to be included in Foundry products? I would say in that case, uh, first off, you should definitely use those names you gave them because spot on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say uh, it would probably, well, first off, I would highly encourage him to create his own creatures. I think that's the best solution, maybe not the easiest, mm-hmm. but in terms of adding more new content for his product, mm-hmm. that's, for me as a customer, that's what I want to see. If I've already got the Realms of Tyranoth, I don't want to see those again. Uh, give me something new. Mm. Um, yeah, again, I, I, I just work, paid five so, bucks for your setting and you got reprinted material in here? What the yeah. hell, man? Mm. Yeah, I would okay. say probably in, in those case, uh, just say, you know, as per page, umpty ump of Realms of Tyranoth, uh, if you really want to include those exactly as they are, it's probably not a great need to reprint those. But usually for the small bits, it's like, say, if you were doing an entire new set of talents and wanted to include a few existing talents in those just for reprint those as well, yeah, that's cool. Mm. Um, but again, come up with new stuff. I mean, that's kind of the fun part of doing all this. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it's sometimes it's a little bit more work, but if you're already creating a whole new setting, create new monsters for it. Make it really yours. Indeed. And uh, and I'm sure one thing I, I do think is interesting, we're seeing people posting on forums saying, hey, I'm working on this. It's going to be like this, sort of like, let's get some communal feedback going. Um, so yeah, if you want to create new things, maybe just, uh, get on some forums and ask, hey, you know, I want to do my own Myriad. What are some suggestions? Here's my setting. What would be a different way of doing, you know, tentacled water beastie? Um, <laughs> because I'm sure there's going to be really cool things that would really shine in your setting much better the way the Myriads do si- shine in the Tyrannoth setting. Mm, good advice. Good advice. Yeah, have again, have fun with this. I mean, this is everybody's opportunity to create uh, and and present and show off uh, what they can do, what their creative abilities are. So, yeah, show off. You hear that? Show off. Put on your, <laughs> put on your fancy dress clothes. Show off. Show off. Get crazy. Not that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Get that crazy. We want to see the crazy. Well, there you have it. There you have it. <laughs> we want to see crazy. That'll that should be, a be quote. the title of another episode. <laughs> so, all right. Well, okay, Narrative Dice, baby. Um, <laughs> uh, Huck, uh, we, we know you are a very busy fellow. Um, it's late, and you've taken your own time to come speak with us and the community tonight. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely. absolutely wonderful having you on. It's been a delight as well. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, and looking forward to uh, talking with you all a year from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the very least. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Huck. Oh, such a fun conversation. I know. How cool is that? I love having the guys from FFG on. They're, uh, they're a barrel of fun. Not only are they very, very knowledgeable people, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of fun to have uh, on the episode. So, uh, so yeah, so um, thanks again, Huck. I think that, um, yeah, that, that should, I think that should allay people's fears if there were any left. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is good. <laughs> well, there is that, but I found I found the discussion specifically around, uh, you know, writing best practices and especially mm. foundry content 
to be just gold. Absolutely. Absolute nuggets of wisdom. Yeah. So definitely. Oh gosh. And and we have a we have a uh, a, a, a we had we had that sort of fifth wall break c- across segments uh, <laughs> that, that we we we, we kind of do need to get to because you know Julie I think we we have this we have this segment where we we bring on like content creators to talk about the work they've created and really highlight it for us we do and we have a couple of special guests for that what's the name of that segment breaking the mold that's the segment <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting flashbacks Chris. Breaking the mold. So the Genesis Foundry is an exciting community of fan-created content for Genesis. New settings, new rules options, adventure and campaign modules, and so much more. But some creators, they go above and beyond. They subvert our expectations, and they break the mold with their work. Our Breaking the Mold segment is dedicated to showcasing an exciting offering available right now in the Genesis Foundry as we separate the pure alloy from the slag and point you to the best content out there. Now, tonight's guests are just two members of the team behind one of the most popular products on the Foundry right now. And one of these guests is a very familiar voice to listeners of the Order 66 podcast. Now, here to talk about the epic Star Carter setting from Studio 404, the Forge podcast is very honoured to welcome Kimber Bowen and GM Phil Mayuski. G'day, guys, and welcome to the show. Thanks. Glad to be here. Oh, and Phil, it's yes. been so long. I know, I know. I, I, I thought we were getting on to like talk about Knights of Fate tonight. Is that is that not what we're doing? No, no, no. Oh, no, not, okay. No, no, not yet, not yet. Oh, oh, um, all right. So, <laughs> yes, your 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 other project. Very good, sir. Very good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, okay, let, let's get going. <laughs> You knew the job was dangerous when you invited us on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dang it, I should have known better. The, the two um, of you in the same room, it's scary. <laughs> so let's let's start with some introductions before we get into this. So, Kimber, Phil, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? What are your roles at Studio 404 and in the development of Starcana? Okay, well, um, I am a, I'm, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a grad student, uh, I work professionally as a technical content developer for software uh, manuals. Um, you could say I have three full-time jobs. Um, I started off as a as a hardware engineer. Uh, I went into customer service and technical support. Uh, but while I was doing that, the whole time I was writing, and one of the things that I started doing was writing documentation because for the product I was supporting, there was none. That was not useful. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I loved it, uh, and I started educating me on, myself on the industry, uh, and eventually I landed a great job working for Dell Technologies. Um, but when Phil and Brett approached me uh, about forming the 404, I thought it was a fantastic opportunity to take my favorite hobby of gaming and turn it into a business. And that's kind of how I got involved in the 404 uh, and what I love doing there. My. <laughs> it's a long story, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Now, Phil, a lot of listeners uh, to this show may very well be listeners to the Order 66 podcast, and they probably know very well who you are. But for those who may not, uh, who are you? <laughs> uh, well, I am Phil Myeski, as stated. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Order 66 podcast, and I am also a freelance writer for Fantasy Flight Games. And I am still having moments of amazement and imposter syndrome whenever I see that on written down. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Good. really well, weird. I open a book, my name's in it. It's it's like, how in God's name did that get there? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I really, I don't know either. You're you're not that impressive. Um, I know. You're 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 really not. I'm I'm quite frankly amazed you're involved with Starcana. Um, <laughs> uh, wow, uh, feel yeah. the love in the room. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so, speaking of that, uh, Kimber and I are two of the co-owners of Studio Four Four Games. There are five of us total. Uh, in addition to us, there's Alex Newbold, uh, Kimber's husband Brett Bowen, and uh, Beth Foot. Uh, I am the lead developer and creator for the Starcana campaign setting and the writer for the Starcana module, Everything New is Old. 
Uh, and because I have the most professional experience in the industry, I'm the primary proofreader and editor for this, for all Studio 404 products, uh, including Starkana. Um, although I did do some writing for Starkana, uh, so I had a good time there. Cool. I'm dying to know, where did the, uh, the name Studio 404 come from? <laughs> Long story. Um, <laughs> It kind of goes back to a, a, a somewhat in-joke, fake union that cropped up in our neck of the woods. Actually, the story is actually on our website, studio404games.com, right. um, where a bunch of us got known as power gamers. Uh, so they, uh, as a joke, a bunch of our friends all got together and started referring to themselves as power gamers union local 404. <laughs> um, where they would like, you know, they, these would be the people who would like min max characters, min max systems, find the ultimate combination. Uh, eventually, they decided to start doing it for for the benefit of others. Um, we've got a lot of like LARPs in our area, and even some other game writers as well. Um, and also, these are folks that I tapped into whenever I was doing play testing for Fantasy Flight Games. These are people who are experts at looking at a system, finding the combinations, and breaking it, and saying, "Y'all need to fix this because this is a broken combo." Um, so that's where like the whole 404 thing came from. Uh, as far as like where the whole studio 404 came from, uh, we were having a discussion back when we were first forming the company, trying to figure out what we'd call ourselves. And the idea came up to like offer uh, top shelf a top shelf gaming experience for the uh, discerning and busy modern gamer. <laughs> uh, and we thought about like you know, all kinds of things. Like we wanted to be a studio. Um, we always wanted to put four. We we had a joke that we wanted to put four hundred four in there because of you know its lineage and 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 in kind of importance to us. Mm. And we kind of went along the lines of like Studio Fifty Four where it was the happening place to be back when it was open. Like, the only the elite were there, the best folks were there. Um, so we kind of put all those things together, and that's where the name Studio 404 Games came up. Very cool. So, Phil and Kimba, what is your first love of Genesis? What do you like to get on the table when, when you guys play? I'll start with you, Phil. Uh. Well, the first love of Genesis is when I got an email from Fantasy Flight Games saying they wanted me in on the beta test. <laughs> um, uh, other than that, I still get to play Fallout Genesis, which is the updated version of the Star Wars hack that I wrote that kind of kicked this whole thing off in the Ooh. first place. Um, I'm actually running a session of that tomorrow. Nice. Ooh. So I'm really looking forward to that. So you very much are a fan of post-apocalyptic themes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Kimba, what about you? Uh, I love the story. So the narrative dice that Genesis presents is a fabulous device for getting that story out. Mm. Um, I like to pitch crazy ideas to my GMs. <laughs> and I love it that my GM now says, no, you don't have that skill. <laughs> or they no longer say, uh, you can't do that. You're not built that way. Yep. They now just sort of smile at me. You're cute, kid. Sure. But let's add a few setback dice because it's really hard. Let's see how it goes. Um, in fact, I remember a while back, uh, I turned to Phil. I was running a, a, a Dresden Files game using Fate. Mm -hmm. And I looked at Phil and said, you know, Fate just doesn't have the crunch it should have. I really wish there was a Star Wars system that could be a, uh, like a system that, that – FFG used that could be adapted for Dresden. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's something that I'm thinking about doing in the future. Ooh. Sort of doing something along those lines will be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so that's why I like Genesis is the fact that I can tell these crazy stories that we can get together and, and make things happen. Very, <laughs> very cool. Love it. So we are here to talk specifically about Starkana. So you guys, obviously, Studio 404 released not only the, the Star Cannon campaign setting, um, but also, as you mentioned earlier, I believe it was Phil, uh, uh, an adventure, a starting adventure as well, to be run in the setting. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Star Cannon setting currently is number two in terms of the hotness within the foundry, in terms of what's being sold. Um, yep. You guys have seen... Uh, you know, the incredible success with this. I believe I believe it's metal now as well. You guys are at bronze, if I'm not mistaken. So 
you know, this is 115 pages of this epic space fantasy setting. It's clearly quite pop- popular. Give us the pitch. If you if you had to describe Star Canada to someone, how would you do it? What would you say to someone interested in buying it? Well, we got a couple things that we kind of like bash together. So I'll give you like basically the elevator pitch version. Um, are you looking for a setting more space opera than Android? Something more high tech than Taranoff? Want to have your characters involved in an evolving sci-fi storyline? Starkana is the game for you. So that's my elevator pitch version. <laughs> Um, I, I like to, to describe Starkana as uh, a sort of space-based world that that takes that has just enough fantasy to take the edge off of hard science. Um, so it's still intriguing to the science geeks out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you don't want to come here for hard science. You're not going to find calculations. You're not going to find you know crazy. Or you're not going to find hard things that could possibly happen in the real world. But what you are going to find are teleportation devices crazy gravity bombs you know you're going to find a short-lived pilot uh who works with a master tech uh, a master mechanic who has lived for eons because he's a dinosaur essentially Hmm. um we're gonna have it, it you're looking at cosmological plot lines that slowly unfold um that's kind of what you can get in the alamacar galaxy uh that said, there's still room to grow. You can build your own planets. It's uh, you can build your own stories. It's fantastic. Very cool. So, what makes Starkana different from from other settings uh, that uh, that we've seen um, so far with the release uh, of the stuff from Foundry, as well as the existing settings that have come out from FFG? Sure. Uh, well, it's a, it's got a mixture of magic and technology, for one thing. Um, anyone who's a fan of Shadowrun, Rifts, or even Star Wars, they're going to feel right at home in the Almacar galaxy. Uh, there's a lot of the setting out there to play in, both official and in the Foundry, that detail or support fan- fantasy, urban fantasy, or hard sci-fi settings. Uh, and we're currently the only one out there that makes the jump into, fanta- into a fantastical sci-fi future. Uh, Very cool. There are a lot of big things that Phil just mentioned that are, are really accurate. Um, one thing that I really like about Starkana that sets it apart, and it's a little bit more granular than all of that, is we have one race that is gender fluid. And it kind of brings an inclusive nature into our, our game, and that's the, the Granos. Um, as master biologists and genesists, mm-hmm. they can alter genders pretty easily, uh, and that happens often on their planet. So players can explore that kind of an experience uh, through Starkana. Very cool. You you mentioned, obviously, a, a, a specific species archetype that's in there of the Granos, mm-hmm. and I'm actually looking at them right now, you know, next to, uh, you know, the space dragons of the Dracos. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, space cat. It's, it's like a look at the cover of Twilight Imperium, honestly. There's a, there's a space cat, um, you know, you, you know, humans, shark people, space orcs, uh, space dinosaurs, dinosaur people, bear, wolf, dog, hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. Um, this is just the archetypes. So, okay, this is a this is a 115 page campaign setting guide. What content, aside from archetypes, of course, can uh, players and GMs expect to find in the setting guide? Well. Um... Starting from page one, you've got an introduction and overview of life in the Almacar galaxy, told from the point of view of one of our kind of uh, 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 voices, uh, Quentin, uh, who's a who is a Granos, Quentin Stumbardi. Uh, he's kind of an adventurous philosopher, is what uh, such people are called. Um, eight new species to give game masters and players uh, new options for races to use in their own sci-fi settings, or of course in Starkana. Uh, many of the careers, uh, we have like 11 careers in there that poured over to other settings well, too. Mm-hmm. Um, new skills and talents. Uh, two new item qualities for gear. Speaking of gear, we've got uh, 42 pieces of equipment, 33 weapons, six new armors, including an adaptation of the power armor rules I came up with for Fallout. Um, 19 vehicles from hover bikes and hover tanks to frigates and fighters including light and heavy mecha suits, uh, jump gate, science, story hooks, 
30 adversaries and uh, 30 pages of setting material designed to jumpstart campaigns in Starkana. Wow. That's just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I read through I read through the guide and it really it really intrigued me. Um it, it's it's it 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 ha, it 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 tastes like eleven different things that I love. Ooh. I mean I taste I taste spell jammer in here. I mm-hmm. taste mass effect in here. Um I I I I taste Twilight Imperium in here. Um I taste high fantasy. Um, and of course, space opera. Um, it's, sure. it's a very interesting hodgepodge mishmash. Um, I do have to comment probably the, my, my favorite part of the world building you guys did was, um, you have, you have divine magic users that are a part of this setting. Okay. Mm-hmm. And th- there's this little touch when you talk about religion, how, when the various species of, of the Amakar galaxy got together, they all quickly realized, although they had different names, they all actually worshipped the same identical five deities. And yep. we, we know these deities exist because they provide magic in terms of divine magic. But they're all absolutely horrible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all five of them are terrible, horrible, vile gods. Can you ask why you want to be a follower of those gods, right? Mm. So that you don't, you know, you know, it, it's either it's either like it's like look, you can go to purgatory or you can you know burn in fiery damnation forever if you piss us off. That's basically yep. it. Yeah, yep. <laughs> those are your options. Wow. <laughs> yeah, the, the Valithic Church was the Valithic, the, the Valithic Church was a fun uh, organization to develop and continue to develop and share all the little nuances and secrets that uh, the organization uh, has. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so you might actually be kind of questioning why you would want to worship these gods. Yeah, um, that was would, my or, first or, question. Or follow them. Yeah, absolutely. The church. Absolutely. Do you want to give us a little bit of a look behind the, the, the screen there with that? Or is that something sure. that they can find out for themselves uh, no no I, there's some of it that can be uh some some of it can be told sure. um the people who are the paladins and the priests of the valithic church the ones who actually get the power to cast miracles is what they refer to them as mm-hmm. um they accept the fact that by gaining the god's attention and focusing it on themselves they are saving everyone around them mm. so when they preach and proselytize on their pulpits or wherever they happen to be um, they are kind of diverting the god's gaze unto them and basically in in their minds saving everyone around them the the consequential benefit of this is the fact that they can actually cast miracles <laughs> People call down unholy fire and erect barriers of defense and and they're they're pretty pow- potent and powerful Ooh. Uh, and as far it's it's somewhat difficult to be an atheist in Starkana because it's like okay I don't believe in gods well that guy over there just uh immolated some dude in black fire in case that dude over there in ice and summoned this weird shadowy thing to help attack like some some rampaging monster or or <laughs> mecha suit or whatnot so it's kind of hard to deny the fact that the gods exist mm, you're not wrong yeah, uh, the thing that I loved the most was just the unique way of traveling between systems, um, and yeah. sort of the the yeah. story be- around that, around the gate system. Mm-hmm. I think that yeah, that's because you know it's easy to I think to fall into that sort of Star Wars mindset where you just you know flip a switch and you're at the next location, but to sure. give each of uh, the way to go between these systems to to have the gates is, is really unique, I think. It reminds me a little bit of, of Babylon 5 type thing. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Babylon 5 was also definitely a uh, an inspiration for a lot of the uh, inter-species politics. Yeah. Um, kind of the state of the galaxy. Because right now everyone's at a kind of a Cold War mm-hmm. uh, mentality. The last war ended 15 years ago with... When one of the empires accidentally blew up their own world, wow. trying to uh, <laughs> stop an invasion of their home world. Yep. So very. Cool. Everyone's kind of like eager and just like, okay, we we've settled things down. We've we've kind of tempered everything. 
and now folks are starting to look around for expansion again and it's 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 an interesting time in in known space mm. <laughs> so let's talk a bit a little bit about the development of stark hunter and, and where all of that sort of started um you you've sure. talked to us a little bit about the the history of some of the the uh, like the church and and we've just talked about uh, the the gates themselves, but what mm-hmm. made what made you choose Starkana as your first offering and and can you give us a little bit of insight of the history of Starkana as a setting? Well, uh, it was a setting that I've been developing in some form or another for the past five years. Hmm. Um, it was inspired by a combination of a bunch of things, an old fantasy campaign world that I created back in the 2000s, uh, as well as influenced by a great LARP that was won by a friend of mine named Mac Brown. Uh, I really enjoyed – he had a setting where an advanced civilization rediscovered magic and had implications therein. Um, I kind of took some themes on that and gave it my own spin, gave it my own taste. Um, because you know, that whole rediscovering magic, it's, it's a common theme. Mm. Uh, but I just kind of like the way that it was, it was presented and, and I had some ideas. So I kind of put them all together. Um, I was actually trying to find a setting to run Starkana in, um, Genesis didn't exist at the time, but once Genesis was officially announced, I'm like, oh yes, no, this is perfect. <laughs> um, the obstacle was what I was just starting to write for fantasy flight games soon after mm-hmm. Genesis hit the shelves. And with that burgeoning freelance career, my writing time was rather short, li- yep. uh, short and difficult to find the time to, to set aside for it, especially for it's like, you know, just being for myself or my, my friends. Yep. Um, so when we put together studio Four Hundred Four games, um, I knew that this could be an opportunity for, uh, for me to, really put some miles on Sarkana, get it developed, and get it to be something that we could share with everybody. Mm. And how long did that process basically take to come together? It, it took about four months. Okay. Uh, we, t- we were doing some tweaking up to right up until uh, the due date, uh, the Friday before Gen Con, mm. uh, and the big reveal at the Foundry. One thing that I would like to add to what Phil was talking about earlier in the 404 mm. um, is that Phil Phil's ideas were de- were amazing and uh, with the fact that he wasn't working in a vacuum anymore mm. I think brought out more of his creativity and we all worked together to create um, an even deeper world mm. uh, and and I think that was pretty useful in the development. Process. Yeah, I gave them some guidelines as far as especially some of the species stuff. Like, here's kind of what I want, and you know, the rest of the writers, Kimber included, um, they came back with some pretty amazing stuff, and it was you know made it into the book, and I'm really really pleased with it all. Ooh. Yeah, we all we all worked together. We sat down at the table, and there was a lot of back and forth on. Okay, well, what about this idea? Well, I don't like that, but how about this? And, and we there was a lot of give and take, and we did really well in bringing it. Uh, I think we did really well in bringing it together, and we're all still friends, so that's a plus. <laughs> <laughs> I want to call an audible on this and and ask a question related to development. Hmm. Um, talk to me about your art. Oh, oh, I had this, so much fun with the art. This is something that's come up, you know, for for a lot of us creators who are working to put stuff into the foundry. Hmm. Um, art's expensive, Ooh, and yes, uh, yes. you know, for 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 little products like this, I mean, you know, FFG was kind enough to to give us some fundamental art packs of just some basic you know, sci-fi and fantasy related art pieces, which is really a handful of things. And that was nice and very kind of them. But you guys have some pretty excellent art um, in this book. Um, talk to us about that process. And do, were you able to find, uh, you know, uh, free or commons art? Or did you have things commissioned? How did you, how did you talk to us about the art? We did a little bit of both. Uh, Brett did a lot of work finding uh, free art or art that uh, we could credit and, and, and use within the uh, within the book. Uh, we also went out and found a freelance artist and and paid them money. And they made us, uh, or he, I should say, his name is Duncan Eng- Eagleston. Uh, Eagleson? Eagleson. It's in the front of the book. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, and he and I went back and forth for about two months putting together uh, what our people looked like, what the, the different archetypes looked like, the mm-hmm. Granos, the Makos, the uh, the Nadinos, all of them. We worked 
together with him to put together uh, to create these amazing, unique and original art. Uh, he actually, funny story, um, the jump gate is very different than what we had originally envisioned. But when we got this piece of artwork back from our artist, mm. we stopped and looked at it and went, no, that's brilliant. That's way better than what we were thinking. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, thinking of like, like all those those obelisks forming an eight-sided ring. That's what I had originally wanted. And he came back with it kind of like all splayed out in a star-like Stonehenge formation. Mm. And I'm like, like that's not world. what I wanted at all. But oh my God, can I do stuff with that? <laughs> uh, so so yeah, we invested a little bit in this of our own money to mm. make uh, a really neat product, mm. visually pleasing, I should say. <laughs> it's very very cool. I'm interested to to know as far as the the process goes because there, there's obviously going to be a number of people that have got small settings that they'd like to develop, but they've developed it as a group. How did you sort of manage that process? Oh, I guess I'll ask the question for Phil. How did, how, because you're the, you're the, the CEO, I guess, of, of 404. So how, how was, was that creator, process for you? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, as far as like the development, the testing and that sort of thing, or, or what? Just as far as the development goes, how did that? How did you manage that process? Uh, it, difficultly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was we all would kind of get together every two weeks and just kind of say, "Okay, who's working on what?" Mm -hmm. And we had a Google Drive up, and we were sharing documents of what we were working on, and making edits and making changes, uh, kind of reviewing it. So it 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 was four solid months of work and mm. revision, uh, and. You know, we kind of broke it down, like, okay, what's section one? Section one is this talk section about Quentin's guide to everything. You know, what, what's life like in, in this galaxy? Mm. Um, one for character creation, one for this, one for that. And we kind of just broke it down and divide, uh, divvied up the, uh, the, the writing. Mm. Um, a lot of it is mine, but a lot of it was contributed by everyone else, too. Mm. And it was kind of tricky to manage it all between, you know, our actual real-life jobs and still doing stuff that's fun because, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. I would say that we had just enough time to, uh, to do this book. <laughs> so There wasn't a lot of free time in the past four months. No. no okay, so no. When, got... when we talk about development, though, I mean, as we know, we can, we can snip time here and there. We can take off time. One of the hardest aspects of development, and I guess one of the last development-related questions I'm curious to ask you guys and and this will key into actually our next episode's topic mm -hmm. um, uh, is is and and uh, who you you mentioned it very briefly with Phil earlier as well. Mm. Talk to me about play testing. Um, you guys have a a pretty heavy laundry list of play testers uh, in your credits. What what were your play testing efforts like, and what can you tell us about that process? Well, most of our play testing was done at Gamer Nation Con Six. Actually, um, <laughs> we took a lot of feedback that we received about the adventure, everything new is old and adapted it into the main campaign book. Uh, for instance, a lot of the manners and mannerisms that GM chase made while playing the paladin or on blaze made their way into official canon. Um, I just loved his portrayal of like, he, cause he played the paladin where he would always like shield his eyes whenever he would like greet other members of the church. It's like, may their gaze never fall upon you. And I'm like, <laughs> well, that's an awesome phrase of saying and greeting and, and departure. <laughs> nice. So I just took a ton of notes from that and incorporated it in there. And yep. every time we ran the setting, uh, Kimber and I, uh, we were the two uh, GMs for that. And we ran it there. Mm -hmm. I ran it a few times here. Um, we would do ad adaptations, like new stuff that we had created since the last time we run it. We would introduce it to the game. Um, so we really, a lot of our playtesting came from the, the running everything new as old multiple times. Um, and also just kind of like eyeballing and reviewing and getting opinions of guys. What do you think about this talent? What do you think about this weapon, this vehicle, this, 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 that, um, these options here? Um, it was a difficult and evolving process, so. Ooh. But ultimately, of, it's all there. A, to... a lot of lessons were learned. <laughs> well, that's the point it's... of playtesting. <laughs> uh, 
But it's it's interesting to hear that you use conventions as or in one in particular to to really do a lot of work. I, I find that to be an excellent, and we'll we'll talk about this, but um, to be an excellent avenue for playtest. Very interesting. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah, we we have uh, a plans to do more playtesting at, at Gamer Nation Con in 2020. Also, so it, keep it your eyes is. out. It's <laughs> it a bit of a plug. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, can you give us a, a little bit of a uh, bit of a glimpse of something exciting that's in the product that we haven't spoken about already, uh, just to whet our appetite to uh, to get our listeners to to really look and buy a copy if they haven't already. Sure, uh, Kimber, did you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, so I can just flat out read a, an excerpt from the opening chapter. Uh, this section is called A Kind of Magic. Uh, it is important to note that this chapter was written from an in-universe perspective, mm-hmm. uh, with the author addressing the reader as if they were venturing out into the galaxy. Uh, so here we go. The strangest thing happened within the few past years. Suddenly, people started using powers that look like Vialithic mis- mir- miracles. There's really no other way to describe it. People tap into this oddball energy and use it to make themselves stronger, more charming, and protect themselves from harm. From thin air, they create ice, fire, lightning, energy, even physical stuff like tools or weapons. It's pretty crazy. In the past, only the church could pull off tricks like this. But now, regular folks tap and manipulate the same godlike powers, or at least one similar enough. In an effort to understand this new power, researchers, scientists, and scholars coined a new term for this energy. They call it Starkana. Practitioners of Starkana are referred to as Starkonists. Sorry. (laughs) Starkonists. And they vary in terms of power and technique. Some use Starkana only after extensive study, practice, and focus, while others have a more instinctual method of implementation. The church refuses to cooperate with the researchers to confirm if the realistic powers tap into Starkana. For the most part, the church maintains that they are watching for the significance of this development. Whatever that means. <laughs> That's a lot of foreshadowing. <laughs> right? Uh, as a bonus <laughs> teaser... Um, everything new is old not only introduces the Starkana setting, so if folks are interested in it, that's a great way to just kind of dive in and see, hey, is this is this fun for me And before you go out and buy the setting book. But everything new is old also introduces a major threat to the denizens of known space called the Bethal Host. They'll be making their presence known in greater detail and in greater numbers in a future adventure. Cool. <laughs> that's not <laughs> ominous. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> all right, guys. So as we close up our discussion here, um, quickly, do you, do you guys have any suggestions for anyone wanting to write for the Foundry or develop their own content? Any uh, hard-learned lessons uh, or, or tips and tricks that you can relate from your experiences? Well, from my perspective, personally, uh, the quality of your product is going to directly correlate with its success. You are your own editor. You are quality control, the art department, the layout team. You're the proofreader, or you find someone to do it for you. Hmm. Uh, FFG isn't going to do all any of that for you. Um, if you're good at adventure writing, write one or two adventures. Get your feet wet. Get get used to the system and, and the methodology of the process of putting your stuff up on on the foundry. Uh, When you write that adventure, make sure you describe the scene for every encounter you have. Set the tone. Um, Give instructions for what your adversaries are going to do at the start of the encounter, as well as any important actions they take later on. Um, Actually, Chris, you and I did a great episode of the Order 66 podcast on this for writing adventures for a convention. Mm -hmm. We did. That was a a good guide. A a solid four-hour adventure is a great initial offering for the uh, for the foundry. Mm. So, um, so, and for those for those wanting to know, uh, that is uh, episode one thirteen one one three of the Order sixty six podcast. Pros and cons. Ooh. Now, Kimber, you had some you had some of your own, right? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, so Brett and I were talking about this last night, and we we boil it down to 
four basic steps. We call them the four P's. Practice, play test, proofread, and prettify. Ooh. So, <laughs> so practice. Writing is an art and a skill. The more you write, the more you improve. Uh, writing, even – I mean, you always want to write, even if you're not going to let anybody read it. Uh, educate yourself on, on, the, on how to write. Go out to the web. T- take some courses on writing. Uh, practice your grammar. There are websites out there that can help you do that. Uh, check out Keith Kappel's Adventure Writing Academy. Mm. Uh, that's a really great place. Brett's in that course right now. He loves it. Uh, read articles on creative writing. Read articles on uh, the seven sins of writing, things that people do that are, are mistakes um, that you can easily avoid. Talk to editors in the field. Learn and practice everything that you can do uh, about writing, and you, your skills will improve, and your, your writing will just get better and better. Uh, play test. Test things out. Make sure they work. Make sure you weren't overbalancing one way or another. Uh, it's a really good way to make sure that your setting and your adventure is interesting as well and that it will actually sell on the foundry. The more people see it, the more you know it's going to be good. Mm-hmm. Proofread. One big thing I have learned in the industry of writing is that it is very difficult to proofread your own work. I know I, I, I can't do it. Personally, it's just impossible. Um, so I recommend finding someone to read your work, someone who can provide honest and constructive e- uh, feedback. When you do this, make sure you check your ego at the door because mm-hmm. uh, it can be a very, very humbling experience to have someone else read your work and pick it apart and tell you all little nuances that aren't quite right. Uh, and Because we pour our lives into this. This is our hearts. You know, It's a passion. Uh, and lastly, prettify. Include art in your work. Make sure you credit that art appropriately, of course, and follow all the proper copyright laws around it, but include it. Mm. Hire an artist. Go to Fiverr, Pixabay, DriveThru, or another stock image site. Learn InDesign or some other layout tool, or make friends with someone who does know it. <laughs> uh, These books aren't just pretty words and a system. These books are visual. They are beautiful things to work at, look at, and read. They are pieces of art. Mm. Uh, So that's – those are the four tips that I would give to someone. Practice, play test, proofread, and prettify. That's fantastic advice. Mm. Well said. Very well said. That's absolutely brilliant. Mm. Um, and that's something that people can have with them, uh, but that's easy to remember uh, with the uh, with the four Ps. Uh, and uh, they can have it on their computer screen while, they, uh, while they're developing their, their manuscripts. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic advice. Um, everyone, pause, write it down now, to mm. be honest with you. So, guys, what's next for the 404? We kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, as the gaming generation gets older we, and we have full-time jobs and families and other responsibilities that kind of weigh, down, weigh us down and make it hard for GMs to put together intriguing adventures, intriguing worlds, uh, not to mention annoying scheduling issues. It is <laughs> so hard to get people to the gaming table. <laughs> At Studio 404, we're hoping to provide a complete complete settings with seasons of campaigns mm-hmm. um, that people with busy schedules can enjoy and, and remind ourselves of the golden ages of college where we would game for like, you know, seven days, <laughs> 20 hours, sleep, eat, game, the good old days. Uh, so we basically want to create... And Phil mentioned this before, top shelf settings for the discerning gaming group to adventure in. Um, Phil, you want to talk about what our plans are for Starkana? Yeah. um, Well, the first thing that's right on my plate right now is the follow-up adventure for Everything New is Old. Um, I hope to have that out by the end of the year. Um, But we're also working on our first supplement. Um, some of the things that we're working on for it are probably going to include new magic rules because Starkana is such a important and, and the magic is such an important uh, factor for the setting that it's 
we feel that it's important to to codify it, uh, give people more insight into like what the general perception of magic using is about in Starkana and what the church is really thinking about all this and give a few more insights into what the church is like. Um, another thing that I'm working on in playtesting right now is a set of rules for learning magic spells. Uh, basically taking the effects that magic gives you in Genesis and having them harder to cast if you haven't quote unquote learned it. Um, I'm playtesting that now. I'm quite pleased with how it's shaking out, but um, you know, hopefully that'll be all. Uh, that's another product that I'm I'm hoping that we can get out the door by the end of the year. That's very cool. I do love Fantastic. your setting, Phil. It's amazing. It's uh, the, you guys as a as a group have worked fantastically together to to bring this amazing product to the foundry um and uh yeah i'd just like to say thank you for for uh, for doing that it's been great we've I'm been glad very you're lucky it. we've been very lucky mm. <laughs> well i'm sure hard work had nothing to do with it oh no nope. no complete no. luck no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so as, 50, as what is it 50 percent per per uh per uh, i can't talk 50% perspiration? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 50% luck? Yeah, that's it. No. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> good. That's, good. that's it. So as Hoolies thanked you for uh, bringing this uh, amazing setting to the community, um, I'm going to thank you for taking time to come and speak with us here on the Forge podcast. Thank you, guys. Ooh. Hey. Happy to. Thanks for having us. You're very welcome. Pleasure being here. Awesome. <laughs> All right. And we look forward to the next offering from Studio 404. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I love talking to those guys. Yeah. Fantastic. Very, very yeah, good. Yeah, Phil. He's okay. Yeah, we're okay. <laughs> we talk all day. The four Ps. Fantastic advice. Fantastic that, advice. That's some, that's some incredible advice. And I've certainly written that down for uh, for just having it on my computer because I think that, yeah, that's – that's sound advice, very much so, and it's and it's great to see that uh, you know they've got this collaborative group working together so well. So um, yeah, very very good. All right, so Chris, should we get into our next segment? You mean under the hammer? Indeed, I do. Under the hammer. And welcome to Under the Hammer, the segment where we will answer your games and rules questions about the Genesis role-playing game as it impacts both rules and content creation and, of course, play. Now, this episode, we have got a couple of questions to get us started. Chris, would you like to read through our first question? Absolutely. It comes in from Ricky Buxton, who says the following. I really struggle with turning the ideas I have for an encounter into simple notes that I can actually reference during the session. I don't want to be reading through paragraphs of notes, but I also don't want to forget to drop a key hint or three. I've seen GM Hooli's beat sheets, but never really understood how to best use it. Um, normally, I end up with dot points, some NPCs, and mostly wing it, but I feel I could do better at bringing the players' imaginations to life if I had more cohesion in my planning. It's an interesting point. Um, I actually spoke with Ricky quite extensively about this just to help him out because it was time sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, look, how do you handle things, Chris? We'll, we'll talk about how you and then I'll sort of go through what I, I spoke with Ricky about. Okay. Um, I'll be honest. Most of the time, I, I okay, so, so there's, okay, let me back up. There's two different scenarios. <laughs> okay. Um, if you have written the adventure yourself, mm -hmm. ra you know, rarely do you have issue with this because it's in your brain. Okay. However, if you are running someone else's adventure, mm -hmm. <laughs> this, this, this becomes a major problem more often than not. Okay. Yes. So, Usually, I'm running my own content. It's mm. not typically that big of a deal for me, and I'm able to get by with bullets. Mm. However, um, in my career, I have run a lot of published mods uh, from a lot of people, um, especially at conventions. Um, back when I back when Wizards of the Coast still had the Star Wars license, mm -hmm. and the Order sixty six podcast was all about Star Wars Saga Edition, their their last D twenty edition. Mm -hmm. um, I paid my way to Gen Con many years in a row by running, you know, 12 sessions or, well, it was like eight or nine sessions of, uh, 
of Star Wars there, right? Mm -hmm. And they give you the module. You've got to run it, and you've got to find a way to make it engaging and not miss those beats. Mm. Um, Mm. Depending on how complex the module was, I would do one of two things. I I could actually get by with some bullets. I could could really do that. If I had a printed module, Mm -hmm. I would even go so far as to take a highlighter to it Mm -hmm. and highlight Mm -hmm. key things just to give myself a visual reference, okay? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and there were also times, do you know those little, those little colored, tiny sticky tabs? Yep. 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 Like sticky yep. notes. Mm-hmm. Um, I would even use those on page ends to call out very specific things or if I need to reference back and forth again. Mm-hmm. Um, that really helped me a lot if I had a printed module. However, there was, I, I will, I will go down to one very specific example mm-hmm. and this was the most intensive I had to do. It really worked for me. Maybe, maybe it could work. I mean, it was, it was, it was a lot of planning to do, but it was really worth it. Mm. Um, a few years ago, actually at Gamer Nation Con, and before that, we ran an earlier version at Gen Con many years prior. Mm. Um, there is a three adventure module um, called uh, the Black Nova Gambit. Mm. And uh, do you remember this, Huli? I do indeed. Okay. And you can run it sequentially. If you want, but the adventure is designed to where to be run at a convention where you have three groups that are literally running through three adventures simultaneously, and they're all three different arms of an attack squad trying to complete a a mission. And as one encounter completes, the success or failures that happen and missions, uh, goals that are accomplished or achieved in one thing will affect the next encounter for a different group at the table. So there's this huge collaboration that has to happen between the GMs and they pause and and share information with each other and stuff like that. I actually had to create for myself as notes a flowchart for this where as they were going through at certain points, I, I, I could literally highlight or circle or mark, okay, here's where they are now. And next to that point on that flow chart, that decision tree, I would have notes for myself like NPC X, a text bubble here to remind myself what to say, what to do, especially if you've got a lot written out and there's multiple flow points in the campaign mm. or in the, in the adventure. Um, that worked extremely well and we were able to keep it quite cohesive. Um, so that might work for you too. And, uh, you can download free versions of Visio, and most word processors also have the uh, have the capability for you to do pretty quick and easy flowchart diagrams. You can put that on a single page and put down your adventure flow with decision points, and put you know bullets next to each flow. And you could even you could even put that on the table and put a marker or a mini on it to track the party's progress through the adventure. Mm-hmm. And when they get to a certain decision point or a certain area, right there you've got okay. There's this NPC, there's these threats, there's this text bubble I've got to read, X, Y, Z. And that, that, that's, that's a, a, if you're really having trouble, that's a really great way to handle complex adventures. Mm, okay. Now, your beat sheet is, quite frankly, a better one. So maybe you can talk <laughs> about that. Yeah, so look, um, this is something that I developed quite a while ago, uh, well and truly before I got into podcasting or, or anything like that, that uh, I actually, I'm going to be honest, and I blatantly stole it from uh, an RPG which is called um, Dream Park, uh, which was from the uh, the 80s. Um, uh, the story with it is, is that obviously, um, uh, it, it's taken a lot of its, um, its beats, I guess, uh, from, uh, TV shows and, and things like that, where you have an introduction. So you have a hook that gets the PCs into the story. You then have, um, either a cliffhanger or a development and then you alternate until you get to where you feel it's appropriate in the story, uh, and then you would have the climax. And the climax always comes after a development. Uh, And then after that, you then have the resolution, which is, you know, what happens after the events of of the story. Um, The the thing that that I found useful is that it's not only useful for, uh, for doing your own adventure, uh, it's also useful if you are running an adventure, you'll just obviously have to summarize. Uh, it's good to have next to you if you don't want to have the, the module open. Uh, the other thing that it can be useful for is for doing campaigns as well. So if you've got a campaign that is going to go for 10 sessions or something like that, that you can start to break down each session, whether it be the setup, whether it be the... 
the development or a, a combat heavy or some sort of cliffhanger uh, that happens at the end of that particular episode. Um, but so you can have it in a micro level and a macro level as well. Uh, and so that really works well. Um, as far as the sort of uh, with NPCs, I can't speak more highly than just having just one of those little note cards that has the, the NPC's name, their motivations next to them, um, as well as, you know, their, uh, some of their stats that they're going to be most useful for or a quote or whatever it is that, uh, that sets that character apart that may be in the module that, uh, that you've either written yourself or, uh, or it's come out um, that uh, is a, is a pre, pre-designed module that you can then go back to if it's an ongoing campaign you can go back to and say, right, well, this person speaks like Alec Baldwin, for example. I don't know how to do an Alec Baldwin, but anyway. Um, so, and you'd, you'd have that on that card. Um, so, uh, you know, and it could also have something that is, is a plot point that you have to get across. So you can have that in front of you when you're playing that character as a, a bit of a reminder as to what it is that you need to convey to the players. Because that's the real point. And there's nothing worse than doing a pre-written module and you've got up to, they've passed the NPC that's supposed to, you know, hand on the quest or uh, propel the story forward into the next segment. And you've mm-hmm. missed a key point that wasn't the, the player's fault. They didn't miss it. You've just forgotten to mention it. Um, and there's nothing worse than sort of, oh, by the way, guys, look, just so that you're aware, yeah. and you have to retcon it, and that sort of takes you out of the moment. So uh, yeah, having those small little notes, it, it's it's certainly helpful. It does. Also, never underestimate the power of a five-minute break. Mm. Agreed. Agreed. Um, it, when, when you realize you've missed something and you don't want to break the flow, get to a decent stopping point in the story and mm. say, guys, let's take a five-minute bio break. And just do that. And while that five-minute break is happening, dig in, find out what you missed, and find a way to introduce it organically. Mm. Maybe that NPC comes back. Or if in the case of, like, knowledge that was missed or a story point, yep. give it to a different NPC. Mm. Give it to one they're about, about to encounter. Mm. Um, quick changes on the fly like that can work to keep you from breaking the flow. Yep. So Agreed. all good Agreed. suggestions. Mm. Um, well, that was a really creamy question. Mm. Uh, Indeed. And a lot of fun to answer, but... Well, I think we had another question as well that came in through Facebook that is uh, of the more crunchy variety and totally up my alley. <laughs> so Rose Whitechapel asks, the augment spell. It provides mm-hmm. one ability die if it succeeds. The text does not address if extra successes can gain more dice, like two successes equals one ability die uh, and spend a triumph for an upgrade ability die. Is this out of balance or what? Uh, no, it is not out of balance, <laughs> and the text does not address it because it doesn't work that way, Rose. No, <laughs> um, and for very good reason. Um, let's talk about augment. Um, and for 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 people who've listened to me rant about this on the Dice Bowl podcast, mm-hmm. um, and you're listening to me rant for, rant about it now here on the Forge, um, I'm a huge fan of the magic system in this game, mm. um, and, and I, I know it very well. And the augment spell is on the in the core rule book at least is located on page 215 in terms of uh uh well that's one of the places that's for the encounter based effects mm-hmm. um is is on page 215 um and yeah if you're successful the base effect is that you add the the target adds an ability die a green die to all the checks they make while they're under the effect of it rose that is insane okay <laughs> and i, I want to put this in perspective for you yeah. Without digging into the math, okay, simply adding an extra die to your die pool, a positive die, increases your chances of success incredibly, mm. okay? Just just one die. Um, you know, five, six years ago, those of us who cut our teeth on Star Wars, we, we learned really quick that if, you, if you're strictly worried about success, just pure success, 
that you were better off increasing the number of dice in your pool mm. versus upgrading dice. Mm. Okay. Now you you don't get you know you don't get to crit, you don't get advantage, you don't get cool triumphs. You mm. want to upgrade, right? Um, but hardcore min maxers in the system, mm. if you could be in the system, <laughs> figured out <laughs> figured out really quickly. No, I'm going to dump my starting XP into characteristics, not mm. skill ranks, mm. because okay, be, because of that fact. Um, to put it another way. Adding a green die to a pool would be the equivalent of increasing your characteristic by one. Mm. You need to understand that doing that is a fifth tier talent. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, in to increase your characteristic. So it's a 25 XP talent and hundreds and hundreds of XP you have to spend to even get there. Mm. Okay. So doing that, even temporarily, for a two purple average difficulty check is insanely good yep. augment is an incredible ability it, it, it is it is currently balanced if you if you increased it more for more successes you would it would become op it would it would really become out of balance at that point mm. um now could a triumph upgrade a die absolutely mm. because that's what a triumph can do for one check mm -hmm. <laughs> if you roll a bunch of advantage you don't could you add boost die? Absolutely. But that's what advantage can do. Mm. Okay. Normally. So, you know, when it comes to triumph and advantage, you use them the way they wouldn't be normally used. Yeah. You roll a triumph. Sure. I will upgrade the check. Mm. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm going to upgrade my next check. You could do that if you rolled a triumph on a combat check mm. or anything else. Um, yeah, but I, I would, I would for balance sake. Yeah. Do, do not change that core ability of augment. It is, it is, almost broken now mm. it, it really is um and this this was clarified for me as i've been play testing my uh heavily my aegis setting my my cosmic superhero setting mm. um where all the all the characters are basically green lanterns <laughs> um aug augment is heavily used okay mm. heavily and it i mean when you got five pcs out there that are augmented and they're all adding an extra green to their pools mm. it completely changes the dynamic of the game mm. um Having said Compl that, though, having said that, it's it's balanced because to maintain that, you've still got to use that maneuver to concentrate on it. So you know that's going to limit the amount of stuff that you can do, or it's going to create a bit of a strain hazard for you. Now I mentioned this as well when uh, when I was talking to Rose about this, and the thing that is a little bit sort of annoying, um, but I understand why, and I'll explain that more clearly in a moment. In the magic section, there is only a chart which explains what you can do with threat and despair. There isn't mm -hmm. a similar chart that hasn't four advantages and triumphs, but that's okay because we then refer to the chart in the combat section which deals with that exact issue. So exactly. if you've got advantages, you know, for every advantage that you roll, you might be able to get an extra point of strain back. You, for two advantages, you might be able to specifically target that person if they're not the next person to act uh, to give them a boost die. So there's additional things that you can do. It's not like Dungeons and Dragons without sort of pointing fingers where it's just a fire and forget spell. Okay, there, there are, the mechanics are there to add additional flavor to the spell without you having to declare it. And the other thing to, to take into consideration as well is that advantages also power certain other effects that can come into play as well. Yeah. Um, absolutely. If, if you've set it up and you've got that extra difficulty in place, they can. Mm. Um, but you bring up a very good point. It, it, it doesn't, you mentioned there's a separate table for threat and despair for magic because mm. there should be, mm. but it doesn't, it doesn't go both ways. No. Using magic, using magic is very powerful in this system. Mm. Therefore it's, it carries more inherent consequences if you screw up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's why you, you don't, it doesn't go both ways. You don't get better benefits for advantage and triumph. And the advantage and triumph benefits you got for regular usage is, is, is good enough. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Very, very true. 
Well, hopefully that answered um, that question, um, Rose. And um, yeah, if I know that there was a fairly lengthy discussion uh, about this similar topic uh, on the uh, on the Genesis forums uh, as well. So um, yeah, have a have a good read through that. There's a couple of good suggestions there as well. So yeah, so look, if you have any questions, such as our uh, friends Rose and Ricky have uh, given us. Uh, if you have any questions you'd like us to answer about developing your own content for Genesis, uh, being a GM or a player, or perhaps even general questions about the rules themselves, you can send us an email to forgegenesis at d20radio.com, or you can post your questions to either Facebook or Twitter by searching at Forge Genesis. And if you're lucky, you might get your question answered here on the show. Also, be sure to join the even larger discussion in the D20 Radio Facebook group, uh, where we nerds congregate to cross-pollinate. Mm, and don't forget to give us a like as well. Mm. Reviews mm. are also important, so drop us uh, one on your favorite podcaster, uh, iTunes, and of course, Facebook. Mm-hmm. You can also visit us on our website at ForgeGenesis.com. And finally, you can find us on YouTube by searching at Forge Genesis. Indeed. And be sure to tune in to our next episode where our topic for the furnace is going to be a really good one. Essentially, for any creator, whether they publish on the foundry or on the game table in their garage, it's all <laughs> about playtesting. That's right. We are next episode going to dive into the whys and the hows, as well as the tips and the tricks and preferred practices for the best method of actually ensuring what you create is balanced, easy to use, and ready for someone else's table. And with luck, we'll even have a special guest with us to help provide some expert wisdom on the topic. But you, listener, (laughs) will just have to wait and see. And I can confirm that that special guest has said yes. So um, (laughs) I cannot wait to to have them on the show. It's uh, the first time they've been on a podcast. So uh, that'll be interesting. Lucky. Looking forward to it. Well, that's a wrap for us. Thank you all for listening, and we hope that you join us next time as we continue to explore the Genesis role-playing game. I'm GM Hurley. May your triumphs be many and your despairs be few. And I'm GM Chris, wishing you peace, love, and good gaming. And remember, the Forge podcast helping you hone your gaming edge. The Forge, a Genesis podcast, is a proud member of the D20 Radio Network. For more information about the network, visit www.d20radio.com. The Forge is a fan-generated podcast. All the information provided on the podcast, the social media, and related website is not affiliated with Fantasy Flight Games or any of their licensors. The content of this podcast remains a property of the Forge, a Genesis RPG podcast, and is intended for educational and informational purposes only. The Genesis role-playing game, Genesis logo, Genesis Foundry, content, and all material remain the property of Fantasy Flight Games. All products available on the Genesis Foundry website remain the property of their respective companies and individuals. For more information about the Forge, a Genesis RPG podcast, visit www.forgegenesis.com. Thank you.